Welcome back to the Pod of Greed. Welcome back, indeed, folks. How's it going? Another week. We're here. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. I ha- I had a good le- week last week. It was a good Yu-Gi-Oh week, I think. And uh, yeah, very good Yu-Gi-Oh week. We went to our local uh, Rage of the Abyss sneak peek. I don't play in a lot of tournaments, but I will play in a sneak peek, and I will lose. But I have a good time doing it. Yeah, how is your sneak peek experience? Better than last time. I won yeah. a match. I mean, yeah. So we uh, we opened uh, we opened packs. And pulled some good cards. It was a very chill, fun sneak peek uh, experience. Everybody was pretty excited for the new set. People were helping everybody else get cards they needed. Mm -hmm. Because we were able to buy boxes to use in the sneak peek. So some people wanted to mod decks before the actual tournament itself. There was one guy with Mimigools that was ravenously trying to get that deck together. There were a couple of people, actually, who were looking for Mimigools. I I feel like Mimigool have kind of become, like, the new... Sort of like just cool deck. Like it's like the deck that a lot of people sort of seem to want to build. It's not seen as like the best competitive thing, but it's mm-hmm. seen as like strong enough to compete, especially at the local level. Right. And it's popular and also like things aren't it's not super expensive. I mean it's really just the best TCG exclusive archetype since Plunder Patrol. Like <laughs> Yeah, okay. It's been a it, long time. Unironically though, I mean it, it might be. It feels like it's the best one we've had in a while. I mean, just the fact that I've already played against two different Mimigool players, and I've yet to play against an Ashen player. It has not happened. I don't yeah, know. Ashen did Where not. Where y'all at? Didn't cut it. <laughs> um, Tistina did not make a dent. I mean, I forget that, that one exists. I get angry when I see Tistina. Yeah. That archetype feels so uninspired to me. Gold Pride didn't really. It just. It feels like. I mean, at least Gold Pride has a look, and it feels like it's memorable. Just. Yeah, I just didn't make much competitive. Yeah, you just played in your combo deck. I don't know. I actually have a hot take, which is just that I think that the TCG exclusive archetypes or world premieres or whatever you want to call them are really they tend to be closer to the power level that I think Konami kind of Konami US at least wants for this game. Mm-hmm. And I just think that unfortunately they're forced to contend with like, you know, Tier Laments and Snake Eyes and like U Bells like just kind of the core game stuff. I was gonna say I feel like they're not allowed to make TCG exclusives or world premieres like much stronger than what they are. I mean, we've had instances in the past, like you know, Burning Abyss, actually a TCG exclusive archetype. Was that not that a decade ago? Yeah, but that was a really powerful one. It but was. also Cosmos, same story, and that was things a couple have years changed. After that. So I mean, we've had like strong TCG exclusives. We've also had TCG exclusives start out kind of weak and then become extremely powerful, like Spirals. I was gonna say Plunder Patrol. Even Plunder Patrol is actually one like events of note. I I, I not, love it's not always a pure Plunder Patrol, but so the thing is, like, I do think that um, there is, I don't know. I think that the TCG exclusive archetypes seem more fun. They seem like mm-hmm. they're kind of more like how I would like this game maybe to be in terms of like deck creativity and power level. But what if we had a world premiere tournament? Unironically, it might be a fun format. It'd be a whole format. Like, like, the only just, thing I would hate is the fact that that means kaiju would be. I mean, but like that's not even that bad if you. It's all, all fun and games you know. until you play against the hardcore kaiju player who does yeah. not. He's not trying to interact with you. Just tribute your board. Yeah, Gradle he's going kaiju second and trying to OTK you. I think Gradles were also TCG exclusives. Maybe were they, were. they? I don't remember. I don't think they were actually, but um. Yeah, fun sneak peek, though. It was cool. We pulled a few of the cards we needed. We are planning a lot of different theme duels. There's a couple different theme duels just from this set. I mean, Konami won't stop making legacy support, so we got to keep making theme duels. Trying to work on, like, a Yugi versus Grandpa deck thing. Um, I just need one more Heart of the Blue Eyes for that. I was really excited for the Millennium support so we could do, like, a Kaiba versus Grandpa duel at some point. Mm -hmm. But looking at... The, the leaks for the blue eye support and what we have in Millennium has now... It feels like that might not be... Uh, that might not matched. be a very... Then again, I guess it wasn't even can, in the it's anime. It's canonical, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kaiba did win. Um, we're also working on Fire King versus Atlantean. No, yep. no, Atlantean. Fire and water. Which is... That'll be really fun, I think. And then we're going to try to figure out something to do with Metal Zoa. There's a duel in there somewhere. Yeah. We just got to find it. They might need like a little more support next set. Depends. Or it might be fine now. I don't know. I mean, 
the Zoa archetype, as far as I can tell, the Metal Morph archetype actually feels fairly solid out the box. It it needs to fill up more slots in their main deck, but um, even as just a simple engine, it feels like a weaker version of the Adventure engine. Hmm, okay. Yeah, so we're going to be experimenting with that. We're just in a couple more cards to get here in the mail uh, that we didn't, we weren't able to pull at the sneak peek. I did win a sneak peek mat. I was pleased with that. I, th- I feel like you've come away with a sneak peek mat, mat in our last, like, three. Yeah, the last couple of sneak peeks I've gone to, I've managed to either win a mat through the tournament or through a raffle or just something. Um, it's a neat mat. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. I always feel like the sneak peeks are able to get me out of the house and to a store consistently. Yeah, I mean, it's a good time. And a good reason to play Yu-Gi-Oh, right? Yeah. So, that was cool. Um, Rage of the Abyss overall, pretty cool set. One other quick thing about it, too. I Today is Wednesday when I'm recording this, and I was actually at Walmart earlier, and I saw that they already have the four-packs, um, where you get, like, four-packs mm. of Rage of the Abyss for seventeen ninety nine. Also, and you get, like, a token card, which I forgot what the tokens are. I was going to say, I was going to ask, what are the tokens for? I didn't you actually know, look. I'm, I'm I was look in a hurry. Uh, if you can find them, though. Yeah, like I was in a hurry uh, just to get out of Walmart, so I just like, kind of zipped past the card section. I was like, "Oh, cool! They have the um, they have the little Rage of Abyss four packs." And it was interesting to me because it's Wednesday, and normally like OTS stores get packs on Wednesday, and that's kind of the perk of the OTS yeah. store is that you know you can buy the packs on Wednesday, whereas they come to everywhere else on Friday. But seemingly. Uh, Walmart had them, so... Walmart's new OTS, yeah. Yeah, you can go play Yu-Gi-Oh! at your local Walmart. <laughs> Which I did do as a kid, by the way. I have... Wait, they they allowed that? Or my local Walmart had like a, a one-time like Yu-Gi-Oh! tournament huh. somewhere in the Walmart. They cleared away a little section, and it was... Because I know Toys R Us was good for it, but I, I never knew Walmart did that, too. Did you find what the tokens are? Nope, can't find them. Yeah, I mean, whatever. I'll, I'll find out. Someone will Sadly, know. when you search Rage of the Abyss and tokens, you just get token support, the card. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's probably, it, they tend to make it based on like whatever the recent anime archetypes from the most recent sets have been. So I guess in this case, it would probably be like a shark token would be my assumption. I didn't even know sharks made tokens. Well, no, it'll be like Shark the character. Oh, like, like Reginald Shark Castle. Castle. Okay, yeah, Reginald like Castle. He would be, yeah, that makes sense. Among other things, so... Anyway, though, we have Yu-Gi-Oh! news that's actually, like, new news. Um, YCS Cancun was this past weekend. That is a nice place to spend a weekend indoors. Yeah. Um, So YCS Cancun happened, and to many people's surprise, Sam from Team Samurai X1 actually won the YCS event. He went 14-0, did not drop uh, a round. That's crazy. And that was really cool, so congratulations to him. I wish I could say I was surprised, though. I mean, he's been about, you know, practicing competitive competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! for a while. Yeah, it's kind of a little-known thing about him. I remember I was, like, sitting there reading, you know, just people's tweets and stuff on Reddit, and everybody's, like, so surprised because, you know, Sam appears to be... He's a filthy casual. He's this filthy casual, screaming, clickbaiting YouTuber, right? Like, that's the sentiment a lot of people have about him, Mm -hmm. at least. And so a lot of people are... Very surprised to know that no, I mean he knows what's he knows how to play this game like competitively. Surprise, surprise, and this isn't like a fluke either. I mean he's topped a couple of YCSs before. Yeah, remember he was doing that like back in 2018, um, and even like he topped the team YCS like earlier this year. Yeah, he sure did. So. I think what was that a second place finish for that team YCS? Yeah, it was like second place. I mean, does so now? So now I'm wondering, does that make him like the goat of Yugi Tube? I mean, I think that it would, depending on where you count people like Joshua Schmidt, I mean, he's like, like probably of the traditional Yugi tubers. Yeah, of like he has the, the old highest guard. accolades of like traditional kind of Yugi tubers, I would say. So, how do you think this affects, you know, Joshua Schmidt's legacy? Or Jesse Cotton's. Or, or Cotton's. You, you know, know, Sam was essentially his apprentice. Has he surpassed the master? Yeah, that's right. No, <laughs> do you know something funny about Jesse Cotton, actually? So he was at this event, too. He got top 32 mm-hmm. um, using, I think it was like Crystal Beast Tier Limits. I did hear that. And it's funny because I think at this point he's kind of just like, you know, running side quests. He is just playing fun. Like, just seeing how far these crazy weird deck ideas of his can go, I heard that he's planning on doing a no side deck run at a YCS. Oh, that's funny. Just to see if that, he can... I mean, when you're, like, that you're good, that good I and mean, that accomplished, particularly at some of these, like, smaller YCS events, all the better. Don't you, you mean know? all YCS events? Well, 
I mean, yeah, so I thought that was just a kind of a cool thing. Not all of them, actually. The next YCS event, um, was it YCS? Ugh, the next big EU one already has like 2,600 players like registered for it. 2,600? Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. But everyone's saying competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! is dying. Well, um, at YCS uh, Cancun, it kind of looked that way. There have been some pretty viral pictures going around about like, you've probably seen the one where it's like, Here's the tables after round three, yep. and it's like just this empty venue. Um, so it seems to me like YCS Cancun did not meet, did not reach kind of the capacity or attendance that people expected it to. I mean, what if... YCS Bologna, that's the one that's YCS Bologna. coming up on 22nd of November. It's got over 2,600 doors have already re- registered. Because, so. I mean, it could be a matter of, like, travel and cost, right? I heard, but yeah, yeah. With the Cancun, I think that's exactly what it was. There was also, like, the uh, hurricane warnings that were going on at the time. So that might have caused some people to cancel their plans. I mean, those could mess up flights for sure. I mean... All of, like, what, the eastern, the southeastern United States is on kind of on watch right now. I heard there was a, there's, like, a, new, a change to visa travel laws in um, some territories as well. Like Are we getting political? Or is that no, what no, 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 no. Oh, okay, no, just checking, just checking. Check no, I mean, I was I checking just, the pulse of the pod. I just wanted to make sure I knew no, what was on. Um, no hurricane denial from us this <laughs> week. But um, it's, yeah, I mean, so I, I think that there are pretty valid reasons why it probably got lower attendance than expected. I know last year's YCS Cancun, I think, had about 800 players approximately, whereas this one only had about 400. So oh, that's a huge drop off. So yeah, pretty big drop off there. But um, but I mean, I do feel that the YCSs in the EU are it's a little bit different, given that uh, it see it feels like I don't have firsthand experience that travel between. Like countries, travel is in Europe is much, significantly seems much easier. simpler. It seems it seems more affordable and also low, just lower distance in general. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, there's public transit that can take you like across countries, which is which insane. is pretty cool. I mean, but then what will we know We're from the U.S. and 372 just, duelists at YCS Cancun, according to um, 372. Project. Some would call that a big regional. Yeah, for some territories, like for some places, like you know. California, Texas, that would just be like a regular regional. Yeah. Maybe in a small regional by some of their standards. So a quick little bit of the results. Um, Sam won first place playing Ubel, but um, Ubel was also just the top two decks in the finals, and it took up 14 of the top 32 slots. So by and far and away, the most popular popular deck there. Then four Tenpai Dragon decks, three Snake Eye decks. So Snake Eye still hanging on a little bit. By a thread. Post ban list. Sprite, Drytron, Fire King, Runic, Crystal Beast, Kashdira, Ritual Beast, and Pearly. So, a nice bit of variety in the top 32. And um, this is without Rage of the Abyss being legal, of course. Mm-hmm. So, that will... Oh, things, things will, will change. likely change Things soon. will change. That is weird, though, because that means that was a post ban list pre-Rage of the Abyss YCS. That's kind of a weird spot, right? That probably didn't help the attendance, either. People don't really like YCS events that are like right before a new set drops Mm -hmm. without the set itself being legal because it just sort of feels It feels almost like a snapshot format. Yeah, these little short snapshot formats that it's like, oh, okay, you won, but like also the meta changed. But, you know, if you're truly, if you're truly competitive when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh, I mean, that should sound like an opportunity for you. I was like, oh, I bet people are not truly practiced in this like specific format. I bet I can be the best in this format for this weekend. Yeah. And that's all it really, you know, comes down to. Like, there will be people who try to take away from Sam's victory. Maybe it's like, oh, well, it was like a small YCS. It was like, it's kind of one of these snapshot ones. But at the end of the day, winning a YCS event is not easy. It really like, doesn't matter. Coming away with 14 wins in a row? Yeah. That's insane. didn't even lose any Swiss. It's pretty crazy. So, congrats again to him. Um, seriously, it's making us YouTubers proud, so... That's right. You got to win it for the rest of us. And as somebody on Reddit said, damn, we got to take him seriously now. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, congrats to Sam. Sam's awesome. He's a hard worker. All right, Paul, when's yours? Uh, not happy. <laughs> I'll just go to YCS okay, first. Okay, then been, just win a Douglas Cup then. It's been like five years since I've been to YCS. It's crazy to think about. It's okay. Just win a Douglas Cup. We'll, we'll, we'll forgive you. Right. I'll starve myself and do that. <laughs> 
Okay, so the next Yu-Gi-Oh bit is that um, we remember Noah Lyles. Um, the basketball player. Right. Football <laughs> player? Yes. Oh, he was in One Direction. Uh, as many know, Noah Lyles is a Yu-Gi-Oh fan, and during the pre-Olympics and Olympics, Konami acknowledged and shared his victories. Well, today, um, today being a few days ago, he shared on his Instagram stories that Konami sent him a goodie bag with a variety of gifts. Pretty okay, cool. what they, what they sent? They sent him a stainless steel dark magician. Of course they did. They sent him a giant blue eyes card. Not right. the blue eyes that we have back there, but actually the um, tablet art one. Oh, the older tab? Okay. Yeah, they sent him the... I don't know if you've seen those like framed card pictures that they've been sending out to people lately. What is a framed card picture? I'm a little um, confused. Oh, they sent him a, a blue eyes figure as well. They sent him the Adidas shoes. Um, and, some, and they sent him a dual disc, one of the recent dual discs. And so, like, Konami's got these, like, official kind of framed pictures. I think they've sent some out to content creators where it's, like, a, a wide picture frame. It's got slots for cards in it. Oh. And it has things like the Egyptian God cards. It's and, for, like, um, card display. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, here, here's, like, a little short. Yeah, so oh, like okay. Says, I have seen Zodia these. pieces. And it just says Yu-Gi-Oh. It's got, like, a ghost dark magician and blue eyes and quarter century cards. Very cool stuff. Um, I bet he liked that. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty cool thing of them to do, to send it out. It's, as people have pointed out, maybe not, like, the best look, but he quite literally got more than, like, YCS winners get. I mean, so he's an Olympic gold medalist, though. I mean, Well, I, yeah, but he won the Olympics, not a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament. So like, some people feel like he should have, like, it's not, I don't, I don't think that it's a matter of, like, he shouldn't have gotten this stuff. I think what other people are saying is just that, like, wow, Konami, so you could be giving this stuff to YCS winners. Because this is all, like, just officially licensed Yu-Gi-Oh! stuff that we know Konami has access to. Like, a Fair. YCS winner could be given a picture frame of cards. That'd be cool. Or, like, a first four figures, blue eyes. What if or, it's just stuff know. they had in the office? They were just like, you know, we're going to put I something mean, together. There's, like, a non-zero chance. That <laughs> Raid the exactly, warehouse. <laughs> there's a non-zero chance that's exactly the case. But, um... Because... You the uh, the Yu Gi Oh Adidas collaboration, I believe that's over now. So yeah, so they, it must have been like kind of just some extras that were kept. yeah. This, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised they had more of them. I mean, yeah, I don't specifically know specifically in whatever his shoe size is. That's a specific thing. Yeah, I mean, they probably had like you know all sizes, just some spares or whatever. I don't know, I, but I do. I, I had to buy my own. Right. <laughs> I do believe that that is something that Konami needs to. Like, I mean, this doesn't seem like this would be hard to give as pricing. I, I don't think so. Like I think CS. in the... But they also want to sell it, and maybe because it's stuff that could be purchased, it doesn't feel... It's like a, a very special prize. But wait, you can just buy a Switch. Never mind, a lot of doesn't try. Speaking of that, by the way, they're still giving out Switches at... Watches I thought we were doing Steam Decks. Apparently, they, maybe in Europe they are, but I saw Pac was showing his Nintendo Switch that he got from getting, like, top four or whatever at the YCS, so... I wonder if... Can I ever get like those. sick of giving him switches? Like, how do you look that man in the eyes? And here's your like eight and switch. Give him and... another switch. Yeah. Listen. That's insane. It's it's not great. Speaking of um, just a, a quick bit on prize support. So they're doing another Master Duel Challenger Cup in the EU. They have not announced any more of them for the US. Kind of weird. But they're actually doing an engraved iPad. That has um, Unchained Soul of Yama, like engraved under the back of the iPad. We haven't seen what a picture the, of what? it. But yeah, for first place, you get an engraved iPad, an acrylic huh. figure of Yama, a game mat, and some sleeves. And it's just kind of like, kind of interesting. Like that Challenger Cups even are just getting more interesting prizes. Because I'm not going to lie, man, an iPad's a hell of a lot better than a Switch, I think. As I think in general, yeah. Wait, what kind of iPad? I don't know. I don't know if there's an iPad Pro or an iPad like. I mean, but. regardless, it kind of is just better than a Switch. There's a lot of things better than a Switch at this point. Yeah. So, unfortunate to me. If you want to give it to like Dragon Duel winners, wait, does Dragon Duel still exist? I don't even know what the state of Dragon Duel is. I'm not gonna lie to like, you. I don't. I don't know. If I don't hear about it anymore. very much. Yeah. No clue what's going on. Honestly. Um. So. Cool. Those were some updates on that. A few new, um, just quick bits. The Quarter Century Bonanza. Uh, there's going to be a release event, and they showed this play map that's got Nightmare Phoenix. 
Yeah. So my issue with this is Nightmare Phoenix does not feel like a bonanza card. I feel like it's, Nightmare Phoenix is like a old, and I feel like everyone has one. It's such a like kind of dated staple. Like you can still find it in extra decks today. It's not like it's not a bad card. It's just we're talking about a bonanza, right? A party. And you're tell you want the cover of that to be Nightmare Phoenix? Not even Griffin, just Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Might as well put Cerberus on there while you're at it. Also a few new archetypes and support cards for um Supreme Darkness, that upcoming set. Mm -hmm. There's new Materiactor cards, if you remember the Materiactors. I don't. What is that? Um, they were just sort of this, I think, TCG exclusive archetype at the time that were mostly level three monsters and they had like Xyz and stuff. I don't know a bunch about them. I've the name rings like familiar, but I honestly cannot think of what a Materiactor looks like. Yeah. Um some new Tenyi cards. Oh, you like those? Yeah, well, I, I I wanted to play Tinya. I haven't really played it too much myself in a while, though. It never... It, I was drawn to it at first, but then I just kind of put it down. But I might pick it up again. Their Synchro Monster can search any field spell, which is getting a lot of buzz. Generic field spell search. Always a good thing. More Mermel Atlantean support will be in Supreme Darkness. And It feels so weird to just get the new, or now, I guess, old Atlantean support, and we have new... New ones on the horizon already. For me, I think it's uh, it reminds me why I think they should just done it as a structure deck because there were like five cards in this in Rage of the Abyss, mm -hmm. and then there seemed to be three cards in Supreme Darkness, which makes a total of eight. And I think that with new starter decks, they typically make eight new cards, eight or ten. So it probably would have just been better to release it as like the water structure deck. Right. As the, you know, sort of counterpart to the fire to structure the deck. Fire. And, yeah, so. It will be thematically <laughs> co correct. It, it would have been cool. They didn't do it, but it would have been cool. Yeah, so kind of neat. Also, a new V-Jump card that was announced is Double Fusion, which is a card oh, that Jaden used. I remember when they just revealed the name and artwork of the card, but we didn't know its effect. So what's it do? It's just a normal spell. Pay 500 life points. Fusion summon a fusion monster using monsters from your hand or field. Then you can fusion summon a fusion monster using monsters from your hand or field. So you just do two fusions in a row. It's actually it's, a card that Jaden did use in the show. It's a slight miss for me, only because I really was hoping it would say this card's name is treated as polymerization. polymerization. Yeah. In the show, also, it allowed him... Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, you? no, no. I, I, I'll say it after. In the show, it also allowed him to, like... He got to fuse then and then later in the turn at a time of his choice. See, Which obviously be, they probably couldn't replicate that effect perfectly. Or but they could if it uses the effect in the, the second fusion is actually in, in the, the grave. grave. Yeah, another, yeah, it's true. That's true. It's hmm, a missed opportunity, Konami. It, but I don't know the with V jumps. They're not made by the same people who make our like the cards that are in our regular booster sets. Yeah, sometimes they feel like their design is up and down. Because like it's not horrible. It's just not searchable. And it, it's hard enough to make an argument to run polymerization, but at least polymerization is searchable in a lot of different cases. This one is going to be hard to search and awkward to use, so I don't know. Last mini product announcement for the big one. Um, in the OCG, or I say the OCG, in Japan at the Kaiba Corp store, they are selling Dark Magician Girl socks. These fluffy huh. Dark Magician Girl themed socks. That's cool. That you can pick up. And also... These cute blue eyes and red eyes slippers, which I might import oh, these. Oh, those are fire. I might import these. Like, unironically, I... Is it, do you, is there one for each foot, or do you buy them? I'm not sure. It looks like, like, from the picture, it looks like it might be one for each foot. Which I don't mind that. I don't mind that. I don't mind that. You know, one red eyes, I don't eyes, think your slippers eyes. have to match. I don't think that makes a big yeah. difference. It's a thing you wear at home, too, the kind of leisure lounge wear. I will get them. I wear them outside. I'm lazy. And now for the big product uh, announcement of the week is Structure Deck Blue Eyes White oh, yeah. Destiny. I really, so they finally announced the Blue Eyes Structure Deck. Yes. Japan has, you know, had this for a while, actually. Mm -hmm. It's actually made Blue Eyes a fairly competitive deck over there. Like, it's just done reasonably well. And so we finally got the announcement for it. It does not come out until February 7th of next oh. year. So, yeah, a little bit. I, I was thinking they'd maybe try to, like, you know, sneak it out in December, Christmas. I think it would have been 
a great Christmas gift, like I think. Best during the holidays. I mean, sooner's better than later. That's always going to be true. I wonder why February. Yeah, I think they could have just gotten this thing out quicker. I think this this would have sold so fast off the shelves. Maybe they just didn't have like an opening. I know, you know, with, with their type of a business, they have so many products they they'll release within a quarter. I'm sorry, man. Doesn't matter. This is a blue eyes deck. <laughs> like you, whatever product has that slot or something, you switch them. But because you, you can't eyes, do quarter century bonanza, Paul. Quarter century bonanza. Well, anyways, let's talk a little bit about this. <laughs> so, structure deck blue eyes white destiny comes with fifty cards. Um, you get forty two commons, three supers, and five ultras. Now, here's the twist: three of which have a small chance of being quarter century secret rare instead of ultra rare. And apparently those are Maiden of White, which is one of the new cards, obviously. Mm-hmm. Wishes for blue, wishes for Eyes of Blue, and Blue Eyes Ultimate Spirit Dragon. So kind of the three most key vital cards of the deck have a chance of being QCR. What do you think about this? Because this is the first time, I believe, that a structure deck has had a semblance of chase. Yeah, it's got chase rarity. Kind of rarity to it. So... Though you'll always I get all the cards it regardless. it is absolutely sick that we're still doing quarter centuries in 2025. Like, my God. Yeah, that's the first thing. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> It'll be 2025. That means the quarter century will have gone on for three years? I mean, it'll be starting its third. Because it started <laughs> at the beginning of 2023 for us. Mm-hmm. And this will be, like, early 2025. And it's just yeah. going to be happening. <laughs> Yeah. But I do think it's cool. Like, you know, you know, I don't like quarter century rares, but I do think it's cool that we are messing around with this type of rarity distribution. A lot of card games do it. Bandai has been good for it in their like structure and like starter decks. Yeah. There's almost always some type of a chase rarity. Do do I? I don't know if people actually chase for them though. I mean, I could see these having some real value. Like, like, but do you think people are actually going to try and buy product to pull it. them, or are they just going to buy them online? Doubt it. I think people will buy it online. That makes sense. I think it could be kind of a fun thing, like at the local level, though. Just you know, if people are because people are going to be buying three of this. Yeah, it's going to be a, a fun three of. So because it's almost a given that you will buy three at a time, I think that that means like it's likely that people will be these will be showing up. Mm-hmm. Don't know what like the chances in the QCR is, is it maybe like, I could see like one per case, because you know, like typically a case of structure decks is either eight or ten, and so if it's like one in ten structures has it, I think that would be a pretty good ratio, yeah. it would mean that like, okay, I go to the shop, I buy three structures, I don't get one, you go, you buy three structures, you don't get one, maybe the next person who does, they end up getting one, so like, that's a, it's pretty decent odds, it doesn't feel like it, a Dragon Master Magia I situation. Like it, it almost has to be, or at least... If it doesn't want to seem predatory, because with this three different cards that can have this rarity, right? Mm-hmm. Three different three ofs. Yeah. So for people that chase max rarity, if they if the uh, drop rate was any lower than that, it could feel really bad if you're yeah. like a max rarity chaser. No, but I'll, I mean, Konami's not forcing anyone to do yeah, it. Yeah, they're not so. forcing you to do it. At that point, it's kind of your own decision. I think this is one of the better ways of handling those high rarity cards. Mm-hmm. You're guaranteed to get what you need in the structure. Yeah. Regardless. And so just getting the extra stuff in high rarity is cool, but not, you know, not, not an absolute mandatory thing. But once again, I think it's cool. Um, just like with the quarter century bonanza, we're just messing with the rarity distribution formula for our sets and products. I think that's cool. Also, this structure deck, just in general, has some really great cards. Effect Veiler, Ash Blossom, Imperm, Nibiru. I love hearing yeah. good hand good traps. Good hand trap reprints. Also, just reprinting things like Blue Eyes Jet Dragon, Blue Eyes Alternative, Sage with Eyes of Blue, cards is that... Is Bingo Machine in there? I don't know. I think, it's, I think it is. I hope so. I think it is. Because if they get Jet Dragon and Bingo Machine in there, that might be the best yeah. Blue Eyes product of all time. And, and I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to like keep it completely honest. I think that this might be like one of the biggest releases in years. Because. Oh, yeah. Blue Eyes structure decks, it cannot be overstated how popular this monster is for like a lot of anime fans, a lot of casual fans. A lot of just kind of passerby, like grab something on the shelf types. 
a lot of I want to get back into Yu-Gi-Oh types. Mm -hmm. This will be, I think, a huge product for those purposes. Yeah. And I look forward to it. I really do think that they should have gotten it out for December. I get it out as soon as you can. I mean, they might I mean, better late than never, but like December would have been great. I I have a feeling that it's not always up to them when they release products. At least Konami US. Yeah, probably not. The um. Because I, I imagine they, ha they had to have known. They had to have been salivating when they found out that a new Blue Eyes product was coming out that they could sell. I mean, they re-released it, for God's sake. I mean, the old one. So Konami knows Blue Eyes is the guy. Blue yeah. Eyes gives you dollars. Yeah, Blue Eyes might save this game yet. <laughs> like, we might start calling it the, like, Blue Eyes Green Dragon because it makes it rain. I mean, it's just... Yeah, it's very much a... I, um, I watched so Also, that was like 4 out of 10. That was not a good... All right, you didn't have to look. How about you let me bomb like privately? You don't have to. You don't okay. have to call me out in front, right, we'll in front of the time. people, in front of the premiere, premiere gang. Rise up. Uh, One's in chat. Totally forgot to mention that. But <clears throat> Konami knows. And yeah, I mean, either way, better late than never, right? Yeah. Like it's still coming out. I still think that it will be a really big product for a lot of people. I look forward to it. Um, Everybody I just, should. I just wonder why Red Eyes can't get the same treatment. I still think to this day that Red Eyes is right up there with Blue Eyes in terms of recognition and coolness factor. But Red Eyes has been they mishandled, abused. It would be so cool if they do a Dark Magician and a Red Eyes one, and then you have like your kind of three starter Pokemon type situation. You just which structure deck do you get? That we would be so much fun. We can only pray that they're cooking that up in Japan. We can only. Yeah. Yeah. Because like Blue Eyes feels like a shoe in but Dark Magicians never had a structure deck. Well, unless you count the, uh, the what was that one? The, uh, the what, the spell counter guy? Yeah. Um, I guess it's kind of a Blue Eyes, I mean, like a Dark the Magician dark, deck. I mean, they would put him in there. But. Like, but we've never had a Red Eyes deck. I mean, yeah. we're so close to greatness, Konami. Make it happen. All right, and some quick Master Duel news as well. Um the new selection pack, Outlaws from the Inferno, is releasing... Well, when you guys are listening to this, it will be out. Um, mm -hmm. Released October 10th. And it adds Tenpai Dragon, Goblin Bikers, and some of the new support for Ritual Beast and Infernoid decks into the game. Okay. So, pretty exciting. Uh, or, or at least it's mixed. Some people are not too pleased to hear that Tenpai Dragon is coming to Master Duel. Did they think it wouldn't? Well, no, people knew it would. They've just been dreading it. Myself included. It's definitely one of those decks where I fear, you know, it won't be very pleasant to face in best of ones. Oh, it no. Is a deck That's that, going to feel horrible. Yeah, it's a deck that goes second and can be difficult to interact with. They have, however, made Sangin Summoning their field spell um, that lets them, like, you know, search a Tempai Dragon and all that stuff and makes fire monsters unaffected by the opponent's card effects during main phase one. Is it two now? So that it's going to be releasing at two. Okay. Which Master Duel sometimes does. So remember, guys, when you go first and get blown out by Tempa, you can take solace in the fact that that field spells at two. Yeah. Just remember, just it happened to you, so that the next person, maybe they don't see it. Yeah, people aren't super pleased. People think they should have maybe hit more. Um, you know, they should have maybe started hit that one that one quick play spell to two as well and whatever, but. We will see. I mean, it might not be as bad as it sounds. I know people often complain that, like, Yu-Gi-Oh! is coin flippy and that, like, losing the die roll means that, you know, you automatically lose. But, but now you can win the die roll. And yeah, lose. so maybe, yeah. It's, <laughs> you can. You no, can no but in thing. all seriousness, I think we have to take, we have to really view Mastodon as its own separate beast because the best of one format. I think people will start to just main cards for the Tenpai matchup. Yeah, that's what it's going to be. If it ends up being a real problem, and I'm sure it will be popular, then people will adapt to it. Like, it won't be just, oh my god, I can't beat Tenpai and it's impossible. It's like, no, you, you add in the cards that are like, necessary it is, to, you know, counter it. Because in, in regular Yu-Gi-Oh! tournaments and the TCG, right, we play two out of three and we side. It, that usually means that if you don't know you're playing against Tenpai, that you might get blown out going first on game one because you didn't know you were going into a Tenpai matchup. But in Master Duel, especially at the high ranks, you'll have to, you'll respect the Tenpai matchup. You'll run the cards that will keep you out of harm's way, 
And those cards will either be useless in some matchups or they'll just block some Tenpai player from, like, rocking you. Yeah, so interested to see where this goes. I'm actually just more so looking forward to the ban list coming into effect. It's going to be nerfing Snake Eye and Ubel a bit, and I'm just tired of seeing them. So I'll gladly take a little Tenpai. On the bright side, you only have to wait three more weeks to your next ban list announcement. Yeah. Um, I think Match Rules has been slowing down with the ban lists, too. Really? So, yeah, I feel like they haven't been releasing them like as quickly. So, that's yeah, Daniel Vedavelli. She plays Yu-Gi-Oh. I saw her on my feed. And I was like, oh. So, oh, yeah. Oh, that right. looks like Yu-Gi-Oh to me. Well, anyway. Um, I think that's all the Yu-Gi-Oh news for the week that has happened. Uh, you covered everything I heard about. You even mentioned things I didn't hear about. Yeah, so very fun, very cool. Uh, you guys can let us know how you are feeling about Rage of the Abyss and also about... Um, Master Duel, if you're playing that. If you're playing that. That's, it feels like Master Duel like has become popular more thing. popular as like the TCG becomes less popular. Yeah. Or but something. speaking of TCGs, let's talk about Pokemon. Okay. Speaking of Pokemon, let's talk about Pokemon Crime. Yeah. Routine. <clears throat> Police Raid finds over $1 million worth of narcotics at Pokemon TCG store. Oh, okay. So it's like kind of reverse crime. Yeah, they well, it's still a crime. <laughs> yeah, or they weren't stealing the Pokemon cards. They were just narcotics at the Pokemon shop. <clears throat> Police in Hong Kong have uncovered a serious crime relating to the Pokemon TCG, discovering a massive stash of methamphetamine worth approximately 1.3 million USD in a warehouse pretending to be a normal Pokemon TCG store. See, it's just a front. Oh, interesting. The huge drug bust, which could likely be one of the largest dollar amounts of any crime related to Pokemon, is shocking fans of the franchise around the world. Soon we'll have a meth-themed Pokemon. Pokemon is an extra... Oh, they're just going to go into their SOE, SEO bait. That sounds like an AI-written article. Uh, it's game rant. So that's... Even well, their, like, even their hear, human written articles sound like AI-written articles. Yeah, it's just like whenever I hear shocking fans around the world, like no one... Says that. Oh, I'm actually. I think I have written that before. I think, oh. I, think I have. You I'm suck. not a great writer. Yeah, that's why you're I'm not, not a great you're not writer. A <laughs> I don't know. It's, like, it's something about that wording and just like shocking fans around the world. Like, not really. I don't think anyone's anyone cares. But no, that that's really terrifying. So, what is there any more to how this how this front was working? Or so we don't have any additional information about how the crime was. Committed, but they do say following the following the investigation of a 28 year old man in front of the store holding five kilos that's roughly 2.2 pounds because we're American of methamphetamine. The police raid uncovered a total of 16 kilograms of the, of the narcotic in an area of the shop exclusively for staff members. So you know, once you find meth, once you find meth in the like staff area, you're like, hmm, I wonder if there's meth anywhere else in here. Yeah, Jesus. Hong Kong police estimate the supply to be worth more to be worth ten million uh, Hong Kong dollars. I have no idea what their what the yeah. currency over there is. Equivalent to around one point three million. We already talked about that. Oh, so that's actually a pretty clean. It's a it's a pretty clean like bust. A tenth of oh, they, I meant the trend, the oh the conversion. The conversion. <laughs> but anyway. but yeah, no children were involved. Thankfully, Good. the. Uh, the, po- the Pokemon TCG was really just used as a front, probably to just keep have to justify I mean, having customers would, coming in and out of the building. Yeah, it would stop them from raising suspicion. I wonder if they moved any of the drugs in like booster packs. Probably, <laughs> or, or something, or at least in like you know boxes filled with. Mm-hmm. Booster packs, so. and then you could even make the argument that if you did get caught with a large sum of money, and you but if you said you know I'm here to buy Pokemon cards, like well, yeah, that's probably part of the code words. There's an implication that Pokemon cards are worth a lot of money. Do you remember uh, this, or maybe you don't. There was like a story a long time ago about the Taco Bell that got like busted for drugs. Oh, for, they were using like the yeah, code words at the Taco Bell, words. and so this kind of just this crazy old lady came in. Like, you know, and she was just off her rocker and she like comes in and asks for like, you know, biscuits and gravy or something. Mm-hmm. And that, as it happened, was like the code word. And so that's how the place got busted. Though it's insane that the, this drug dealer working at, working at a Taco Bell, he, this, this crazy lady's talking, says their code word. And he's like, 
Are you sure you want it? Okay. Well, the thing is, though, is like, I mean, if he's crazy and senile, then that might be the behavior you'd expect from someone who's all strung out on the drugs. So. I guess that's true. I just feel like like you should have a bit of a, a bit more awareness to not sell in that situation. But we're not here to defend criminals or even make sense of what they do. Yes, yeah, just kind of an unfortunate story. Yeah, I, well, when it comes to the Pokemon TCG, as many positive stories as there are, there will be unfortunate ones. And sadly, the unfortunate ones are the ones that I search for. Yeah, the weekly Pokemon crime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, any other TCG things? Oh, yes, for sure. Okay, good, because I didn't find too many, so I'm happy to hear what you've got. <clears throat> 87% of eBay's trading cards experts earn less than a living wage, says union organizers. So this is going to be connected to that ongoing thing about uh, eBay and labor unions. Oh, I don't actually know too much about this. So It's been going on for a little while. Let's Fill see what they in. have to say. TCG authenticating is an integral part. That's just... Okay. The campaign to organize digital employees in tech games and digital industries, that's Code CWA announced that members of eBay's Authentication Center in Syracuse would be holding a rally on October 3rd to demand a living wage. The majority of eBay Authentication Center workers in Syracuse earn less than a living wage for a single person without children, despite the fact that eBay is worth almost $29 billion. The authentication system or center in Syracuse deals with thousands of Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic the Gathering cards a day, and most of the workers see authenticators standing in one spot sorting inspected cards for hours on end. It's pretty rough when you're standing in one spot sedentary for extended periods of time. An authentication worker, I cannot say that, I don't know how you pronounce that name. A lot of my coworkers have sciata, sciata issues, am I saying that right? Um, yeah, I see what you're talking about. It hurts more to not move than it does to move. Yeah, so they have to stand in the same place, authenticating cards all day long, and they're getting underpaid for it, is my understanding. Yes. Uh, Wakona or Gia Kona, I don't know how to say her name, reveals that her wage starts at just sixteen twenty five an hour. And it's revealed that the medium wage at this center is only eighteen twenty five an hour. Okay. Um, well... That's, I was not really sure about this story, but it's certainly interesting. I mean, I know that eBay has, they've started doing their sort of card authentication thing. And it's good that they do because there are a lot of fake cards that, you know, go around. Mm -hmm. Particularly with card game collecting and that whole market being a lot more valuable and a lot more like, you know, just attracting a lot more eyes in the last few years. It makes sense that this is kind of a job is being an authenticator. But I hadn't considered that it was um, maybe as difficult a job as it sounds, having to stand all day, working long hours, getting you know minimum wage at least in that area. Why can't they have chairs? I don't really know. I wonder why they can't. I guess it's probably just something to do with like either they're having to like, like maybe where they're authenticating the cards is it's just. I mean, it's probably just cost cutting. It's like, they just don't. They don't even want to like invest in chairs. They don't want to invest the, in desks because maybe it's easier somehow this way. I'm always impressed by how many jobs you're just not allowed to sit while doing them. But you just you don't get a you don't get a you don't get a fucking chair. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Especially I, since you know eBay, they tout quality. They want you to trust their authenticate authenticators. They want you to be able to send your expensive cards to them and trust them to get the job done right. And then they have people who are underployed, at, under underployed, underpaid, and in pain all day. Yeah, hmm. I. I don't like it. I wasn't aware about this, but hearing about it, I hope that they are able to negotiate for some higher wages because it sounds like they're already making less than the median wage. And um, at least some people are. And I don't know. I mean, it's just, there's not a lot more to say about it. I tend to stand on the side of like workers who are negotiating for better working conditions and better pay. I don't think that there's much more to say about it than that. I think that one other thing that I'll add is that I know it's based in Syracuse. I think that they teamed with TCG Player for this service. I don't remember if that's true, though. I mean, doesn't eBay own TCG Player? Uh, maybe? So I, I believe I, eBay do they actually own owns TCG Player, and so that they actually share an authentication system. I want to actually know, because 
If so, that's uh, a little bit concerning because I, I buy a lot of stuff from TCG Player. Yeah, okay, eBay has entered into a, an agreement to acquire a TCG Player, and that was like um, back in 2022. Mm-hmm. They bought them for $295 million. Okay. So, I mean, if you deal in cards in the United States, I mean... So that makes me worried then that, you know, when you buy stuff on TCG Player and it's got the whole, uh, like, authentication guarantee, these are probably the same people because I know that TCG Player is based in Syracuse, so... And then, and so, the word that expert, I kind of want to, like, zoom in on that because they, they call them TCG experts so that we feel safe and comfortable oh, with like them the rating our cards. Yeah. But then their experts don't even get chairs. Yeah, they're not really treated well. Interesting. Like, are, they, are they really experts then if you don't respect them enough to give them a chair? You know, I, want, I think I'm going to try to look into this story more. I would like to, because I mean, you know, I traditionally have trusted TCG Player and really liked them and spent a lot of my money there. But if it's, I don't know how this escaped my notice, but if they are, uh, if the working conditions there aren't, are like this, and the wages are like this, I might have to reconsider. Hmm. Now, to be fair, I don't actually know what our alternative is. But yeah, that's the problem. Because like, I was going to say, oh, I'll just start buying on eBay, but like, wait a second. Yeah, the TCG play on eBay, yeah. I pitched one, like the, one same. And the same. Amazon? Ooh, that doesn't oh, feel God, good. Amazon's worse. <laughs> that didn't feel good to even say. Man, who do you buy from? Your local card shop if they have it. That's all you got. Yeah, I mean, As long as it's not a front. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's not a front like the Pokemon store. Interesting, I'd like to hear people's thoughts on this. I mean, I know it's not like, you know, a super sexy headline, but it's unfortunate because there are people who do work at these places and need better wages and working conditions. But do you know what is a super sexy headline? Mm-hmm. Bandai Namco lays down its cards, revealing a new Gundam TCG. Yeah, okay, this is what I was looking forward to chatting a little bit about. Um, the new Gundam TCG, right? That's right. Attempting to stake its claim to an even bigger share of the trading card game market, Bandai Namco is positioning its 45-year-old super robot franchise. Now, calling it a super robot franchise is a... I'm not going to get into why that's an incorrect statement, but it is. Uh, Mobile Suit Gundam as the next competitor for Magic the Gathering and Pokemon. All right, let's not, let's not throw it in that ring immediately. Well... I mean, so just to cut out all of the, like, press release talk, I mean, just tell me, tell me about it, because I don't really, like, I don't know a whole bunch. I know, I'm assuming, did you, I, I saw that they had a sort of reveal video. It mm-hmm. was sort of like an ad. You're a Gundam fan. Yes. Tell me about this TCG. Like, uh, it, your... exi- it will exist. Okay. Um, the, no, it's you, coming out you early. Tell me, like, are you is this something so, you're going to play? Yes. In short, I will play the Gundam TCG. Okay. That's because I'm, I am a Gundam fan. Um, but I don't really know what all there is to really say about it. It's certain. It's a it's a different TCG, but it's a Bandai style TCG. So that if you've ever played Union Arena or One Piece or Digimon, then you. You you will feel fairly comfortable with the way that they make their own, their style of uh, TCGs. I think the unique mechanic of Gundam versus probably every other card game is instead of having you know monsters, creatures, items, you have mobile suits, and then yeah. you have pilots that pilot the mobile suits. And you you're not this isn't like the TV show where the where one guy pilots one machine the whole time. Any one of your pilots can pilot. Any mobile suit that you use. I saw something about like an HP or defense system. Yes, Is that, uh, I don't know the, the exact details, but I mean, I haven't, I haven't looked into the exact gameplay specifics. But you can, you can look at the mobile suits. I like how Pokemon work with hit points. Yeah. Okay. And a your a mobile suit can be you know destroyed and it, and it can take damage, but it can also be repaired. A pilot can doesn't have to stay in a mobile suit; they can switch to a different one. I'm not a I'm not a hundred percent on the full uh, mechanics and how the how tricky it can all become. But there is going to be a beta of this game because this isn't supposed to even come out until 2025. 2025 yeah. like I think first quarter twenty twenty five. But there's a beta of the game that, sh- that should be going around. I don't know if it's, I think maybe still this year. I don't remember said it. Well, here's what I found, sort of a synopsis of this video. 
Um, worldwide release in 2025. 50 card decks with a max of two colors. There are four card types. There are units, pilots, command, which is just like a spell, and bases. So that kind of sounds like a spell card, a field card, mm-hmm. a character card, and then like the actual unit. Um, the colors that were shown were blue, white, green, and red. Yellow That's was also shown in a product video. Very Bandai. You attack players' base to break their shields. They have six shields. And like in Digimon, you need one final attack on the player in order to win. Pilots can be paired with any unit, like Digimon sources. Um, Link units are special pilot to Gundam pairs. For example, Ariel and Suleta. It's from like Witch from Mercury. Uh, Units have attack and HP. The game's got summoning sickness, unless you have a Link pair. Um, So... Yeah, and then it kind of goes on. There's more stuff, but... What is a link pair? So a link pair is like Ariel and Suleta. So a specific... if this It sounds like if a specific pilot is with a specific Gundam, then mm-hmm. they don't have summoning sickness. And oh, maybe get additional... So you can get rewarded for using the appropriate pilot mobile suit combination. Yeah. Um, command cards are like spells. They have an instant version that can be played on either turn. Some pilots can be played like a spell or used as a pilot. Um, Base cards are similar to a field spell in Yu-Gi-Oh. It could be a ship or a colony. Mm -hmm. Shields have a base HP of 1. Base cards have their own HP that you need to deplete in order to kill them. Interesting. So it sounds like the theme of the game is you are not the... You're not the mobile suit. You're not the pilot. You are a commander of mobile suits and pilots. And you use them to battle against another commander. You can be in a ship. You can be in a colony. And your deck is essentially your army. Um, and they have alt arts like other Bandai games. Gotta have them. So this is cool. As a Gundam person, what are you? What are characters that you hope to see? Maybe. So I'm a big Gundam Seed fan, and I know Gundam Seed is one of the uh, launching titles within the product. I believe. In fact, I, I had a list. Where was it? There will be the original 1979 Gundam series, Gundam Wing, Gundam Seed, Gundam Unicorn, and the Witch from Mercury. Awesome. All at launch. That's cool. I'm. I will definitely like be checking it out. I don't. You know, it's tough to get me to play mm-hmm. card games, but I watched The Witch from Mercury and really enjoyed it. I've watched Iron Blooded Orphans and really enjoyed it. Thanks to you, you showed it to me. And um, I would play characters in like mobile suits from either of those anime. The only ones I easily recognize. I think it's really important to get the right mix of Gundam TV shows because. It's coming to the West. We are not the same as Japanese Gundam fans and viewers. The what the Gundams we like are different from theirs. Like for instance, uh, you know, G Gundam is held in high regard out here mm-hmm. versus how it's regarded in Japan. It's, they don't hate it, but it's like not super popular. You know, if you say Gundam to like a random person on the street, G Gundam is one of the first things that pops into their head. They want that Dragon Ball Z yelling action style Gundam. Maybe not the like cold political, you know, kind of yeah, uh, space opera Gundam that many other people are fans of. And but it, I do think it's important that they got Gundam Wing in the very first release too, since that's another really popular Gundam for us. I, I remember when I first got wind of this game, I said it needs to have G Gundam and or Gundam Wing in that very first set if it wants to have any chance of doing numbers here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I will I will certainly take a look at the game, um, if Bandai would like me to anyway. <laughs> and I will play Suleta and the Ariel. Well, because it sounds like the only one that's going to be unreleased that I'll know about. I mean, they'll have, they'll have like many pilots. Yeah, you like might find a new them. one you like. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, um, one other cool thing I saw about it was that the commercial sort of trailer or whatever they showed seemed very similar to a um, an OCG Yu Gi Oh trailer that actually was made like last year, where like it starts off with somebody getting a car, like a kid getting a card and mm-hmm. opening it up, and that like, kind of this whole world of people and they're all playing. It feels like it's really directed by the same person. So it sounds like if they're going to be like bringing that level of marketing in, like these cool live action trailers and stuff, that they are pretty serious about you know making this stick in the West, and that's something that I wanted to ask about as well. Is I mean you know there are currently four active Bandai TCG games, 
with the Dragon Ball Super Fusion world, there's Digimon, there's One Piece, and now recently there's Union Rio. It's already on store shelves, and it's, it's around. Mm-hmm. So this will be like their fifth game, and it's releasing in probably like six months from now. Paul just said, no, ignore Battle Spirits. Well, I don't really see very much of that. I kind of <laughs> didn't think it was an active game. Sorry, what? This will be their sixth. Might be. Um, so, I mean... You offended how two does people this, in chat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to the both of you. How does this slot in? The sixth game. Like. I have absolutely no clue. Um, I all, I really wasn't sure. So for sure. yourself, as somebody who partakes in like about half of the Gundam properties, or the, the, sorry, uh, not the Gundam properties, the Bandai card game properties, does this replace one of your games? Do you just add it to the rotation? Where in the priority I mean, list do you feel it will be? It just, right now, for me, it kind of starts at collect- collector's tier. Okay. I really don't have space on my plate for an additional TCG, and I can't think of another game that I would replace it with. I mean, I can't play Yu-Gi-Oh! less than I already am, and you know, I, I love playing Digimon. I don't want to replace that with Gundam either. And I think that's a conundrum a lot of people are going to run into. Yeah, that was kind of what I was worried about. It's just like, I sometimes think that Bandai... I'm going to talk about this a lot here. They just released so many games. And maybe I'm viewing it wrong. And maybe what they're really going for is like the ability for people to just pick a property that Bandai owns and there's a game for it. And you just, it's not supposed to, like you're, I, I'm a Bandai card gamer. You're not supposed to really like pick and choose almost. It's just like you just play them all. Which is not financially feasible by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, but I maybe they're on to something because the, you know Union Arena just launched not long ago, and I saw a lot of One Piece players. They were at least willing to pick up the, that first product. I saw a lot of uh, One Piece players trying out Union Arena. I don't know how many of them are going to want to try Gundam. Maybe a different like Bandai player base will try Gundam. Maybe the Dragon Ball player. I mean, Z- player Z. I didn't mean there was only one. No. There has to be at least two of you. Um, I yeah, you know, I even wonder how po- is Gundam popular enough to like carry a card game? All right, don't do that. No, 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 no. I, l- hear me out. So you know, One Piece obviously is. It's more yeah. than popular enough to have a card game. But like, I mean, Dragon Ball is huge, and people don't really seem to play its card game much. Very so good. So it kind of makes you wonder. Now, in addition to that, I think Gundam to me, has always felt like one of these properties that everybody knows of it. I don't know that many people who necessarily like... Like, I wonder how many people really love Gundam enough to play the card game, the Gundam card game. I think that's actually the strength of it. People can people can invest in the Gundam card game at whatever level they want to because... The issue with Gundam is a lot of people have that one Gundam series from their childhood or from years ago that they watched and they love very much, but then getting into the wider Gundam world feels too... Feels, feels, daunting, it's kind of maybe. daunting, scary. Too many other names and things they never heard of before. But you can pick up this first product and just focus in on Gundam Wing if you want to. Shut out all the other types of series and characters and just focus just on Gundam on Wing. Be okay. Like. And the same thing's gonna probably happen next set. Like, there's no way the next set's gonna come out without G, uh, G Gundam, right? right? That's a lot of people's favorite Gundam, and they'll just be able to focus on G Gundam. And there's enough like mobile suits and characters where they can do this for a long time. Okay, well, I'll be looking forward to it. I hope that they will have you know more events and stuff, preview it to people, and get others' opinions on the game as well. Any more TCG news? Nope, that was my last one. The last CG story, great. Now we can hop into the fun world of everything else. It's it's like an every uh, bagel with everything on it, just lots of. So um, I noticed that we're all tired in today's podcast. Maybe we didn't get enough sleep. No, no, I had a decent amount of sleep. Okay, well I'm a little tired. I didn't think I woke up on time. Okay. Did you know what would have helped me wake up on time? I couldn't tell you. A Nintendo alarm clock that they just announced today. Forget the Switch 2, Nintendo just released a $100 interactive alarm clock called Alarmo. This is real, it's not a joke. Okay, the name Alarmo sounded fake, I'm not going to It's a real thing. With the gaming world waiting with bated breath for Nintendo to announce the Switch 2, the company behind Mario has once again surprised its fans with the announcement of a completely unexpected piece of hardware. 
an interactive alarm clock. Thoughts? I need to hear more. Ever wish that you could wake up in one of the playful worlds from Nintendo? The company asked in a note to press. It sounds dark. Um, well, it's time to stop dreaming. The Nintendo Sound Clock Alarmo is an interactive alarm clock designed to add some Nintendo charm to your home and your daily routine. So it's coming out in 2025, and I'm going to leave the price a mystery for now and let you guess once you've heard everything. Okay. Um, with Nintendo Switch Online members in the U.S. and Canada being able to actually buy it right now via the My Nintendo Store. So, it features a motion sensor technology that responds to your movements, which lets you snooze your alarm with motion alone and stop it by getting out of bed. So you get out of bed and it stops going off. Okay. You can pick from 35 scenes inspired by five Nintendo titles, Super Mario Odyssey, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, Splatoon 3, Pikmin 4, and Ring Fit Adventure. Uh, what is a scene? Um, then set a time and let Alarmo do its work. So, a scene is... This is the blurb from Nintendo. In the morning, you'll experience immersive sounds and music from the scene that you picked. So you can oh. rise to sounds of the Mushroom Kingdom with Mario and friends, or begin your day's journey with Link and Princess Zelda, or start fresh with the Inklings from Splatoon 3. And those are just some of the experiences. You can also check records to see how much you move around in your sleep, set an hourly chime themed to your chosen title, change between steady or gentle modes for your morning alarm, in steady mode, the alarm will gradually get more intense the longer you stay in bed, whereas gentle mode offers a more consistent intensity level. And there's a button mode for a more traditional tactile hit the snooze button alarm clock experience. And you can even use sleepy sounds to wind down with soothing music and sounds at your set bedtime. I know that was a bit much, but yeah, so that's the Nintendo alarm clock. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's, there is a trailer to go along with it, but... Um, uh, it's like three, four minutes long, so I won't bore you too much with watching it. But um, yeah, would you want a um, an alarm clock like this? That kinda... I mean, it sounds cool to me. Sounds, sounds like a cool alarm clock. And how I much do you think it, it costs? Uh, so how much do I think it should cost, or how much it actually costs? I mean, how much do you think it costs? So I think it'll cost about the same price as a Switch. I think it should cost thirty bucks. Um. It's a hundred dollars. You can see this girl waking up to her Super Mario. Under no circumstances should anyone be paying a hundred dollars for a clock. Yeah, I don't really understand the like what they're trying to go for here. You know, thirty dollars is an expensive clock, right? Yeah, I do. I, I mean, I was going to ask: Do people still use alarm clocks? But I think that people do still use them. Like a traditional alarm clock's good if you want to like get rid of your phone before bed, so you just right. get up with your actual alarm clock, not like phone to start scrolling on Instagram. Though I actually feel that most a lot of people just use both. Yeah, I've been trying to like get rid of my phone more before bed. It's difficult because I just feel like I just sit and like stare at the screen. So I just let scrolling. it die. That might be a good idea. Just like literally let it just let it die. Down. But um, so yeah, I mean, you can wake up to the sounds of Mario and Zelda characters and just pay a hundred bucks for that. Nah, a hundred is way too much for that. I don't understand. I don't get the logic. Is this supposed to be a product for the Nintendo super fan who just has to have everything Nintendo? I think that's actually exactly who it's for. Because like, in that I, case, I that you is, still could have made it eighty. This is meant to be a product that will likely i mean listen it's it's really for the super fan i don't think it's for anybody else i think this is also something that like in you know five ten years when it's just not on sale anymore it'll kind of go into like a retro you know nintendo collection and it's worth like a thousand bucks because like you have one of the few nintendo mm -hmm. alarm clocks but i don't think i would hope that they're not actually expecting this to be like a a thing that a normal person buys. A like hundred bucks sounds like too much for an alarm clock that your significant other is going to tell you to get like to put away because they're not going to want to wake up to whatever your favorite Mario or like Nintendo game is. Here's something kind of interesting about this. Um, you, it's worth noting that Alarmo is only compatible with twin to king size beds. What do you mean compatible with a bed? What does it, what does so, it do? So, like, it should be placed facing the center of the bed. 
within arm's reach and no higher than eight inches above the sleeper. Nintendo said if there's more than one sleeper in the bed, then they recommend using button mode for the best experience. Oh, because so, there's a sensor that's looking for yeah, movement. So it's, it seems like it really only supports like tracking one person, basically. So hmm. you and your SO are like sleeping together, and maybe that would kind of throw off. Now, the it's a sensor, like a motion sensor, not a camera, right? Yeah. Because that would be very strange to set up this camera to watch you sleep. Well, you know, people already kind of have those. Like, they're like smart, clo- like smart sleep clocks and sleep tracking things that do like have cameras and. You can like check, like how you moved and fidgeted. I mean, I don't have I one, but like I've heard that that exists. Caution people to not to when it comes to something like that. Yeah, that sounds very you're terrifying. Just, you're giving away data to like to like a company that I don't think needs that data. They don't need to know your sleep data. That's yeah. That if feels you're worried intrusive. about Alarmo spying on you in your sleep and telling them to know how much you toss and turn. The company insisted the device does not communicate any information to Nintendo. So, uh huh. Who knows if that's true? Nintendo's like we're really more of a data company now. Yeah. <laughs> like every like every corporation in yeah, you know, eventually just become everybody's a data, a data company. company. Yeah. Let's harvest a little data. Just a little bit. Yeah, hey, Alex, so, let's know a couple more things about, you know, how you sleep. And that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> it's, you know, what, what time you went to bed, what you were thinking about. I can, I can you know, send you a few more ads as well. Yes. Uh, Based on, you know, your sleep patterns or something. Oh, God. What you moaned in your sleep. Oh, no. That tells me what you want to buy. It's like, is, is Marissa your ex? It's like, ah. Oh, we found a, there's a Marissa nearby. So it's like, <laughs> contacting Marissa. Don't do it. Yeah, you can call them and let them know that you're having trouble sleeping. And they might the, want to come and warm you up at night. The, hopefully, that's beyond the purview of a Nintendo product. Maybe yeah, that sounds more like maybe a, Alexa. You know. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah. So fun little Nintendo news story. Um, I will not be buying, but someone will. So, <laughs> I mean, you remember we were saying like the PS5 Pro is a crazy high price, and yeah. no one cared that it's still sold out. This probably will too. Oh, n- most definitely. Like you said, people are gonna try and scalp this thing. Yeah, so that's your gaming story for the week. I do have another gaming story as well, but you first. What you got? I don't have a gaming story, so you might as well oh, finish. Okay. Give right. us the, your other gaming story. Well, real quick, this is a little bit different, but Ubisoft responds to rumors about Tencent's potential buyout. So you might have heard that Ubisoft has not been doing super well lately. Um, the gaming giant says it regularly reviews strategic options. Yeah, there were rumors that Tencent was going to be buying out the French game publisher Ubisoft. Um, they have not confirmed or denied it, but they just said that they are reviewing its strategic options. Um, it follows an earlier report from Bloomberg that says that um, they're trying to stabilize Ubisoft and bolster its value because its shares plunged 19% last month following news that it was delaying the launch of Assassin's Creed Shadows and reported lower than expected sales of Star Wars Outlaws. So, they say they are currently focused on open world and live service games. So, typically, when a corporation is trying to get bought out, they want to bolster their value. So, it, I mean, all signs point to they are trying to get bought out by Tencent. They have to make it worth Tencent's like, dollar. Yeah, never thought I would... Um See the day that like Ubisoft would be in such dire straits. I did. You think? Okay. Yeah, at some point it just felt like Ubisoft was kicking a can down the road. It felt like Ubisoft games were kind of just kind of reiterating on themselves over and over again. I didn't see a lot of like fresh ground broken unless it was in live service or monetization practices. They're good at those. You know, I say all this. I don't really even know what like games that like Ubisoft makes these days. And I know they obviously make like Assassin's Creed, but that's long since stopped being a yearly franchise. And I, mean, I thought that Assassin's Creed Shadows looked pretty good. From the little we've seen, I was I was interested in it, but we are we know what the social media outcry around the game has been, and that's not the that's not the media you really want around a new game. Well, I think it says more that like there's so like look what it said. You know, like we're in this industry where mm-hmm. there's a big like You can see, like, just, okay, everybody's talking about games get rushed, and, you know, they're so buggy and glitchy, and they release, and they're unfinished. 
But look what happens when a company delays a game. Your stock price plummets because yeah. there's this perceived weakness and like, you know, you're losing your grip and all of this and this game's going to be bad. It's like, no, it just means that they're delaying it to take more time to finish it. Right. And it's kind of crazy because it's like, I know what shareholders want is like, release Assassin's Creed Shadows yesterday, right? Yep. So they can and make get sure, those you know, sales. Make it game of the year. Make so it game of the year. All these get all the sales, have their pre-order bonuses and some DLC or whatever. But it's like, no, they're trying to finish it and make sure that it is good. And this has nothing to me to do with even like the whole like, oh, it's, it's woke or whatever, racism. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying like, no matter what the sort of setting or whatever the game is, I think that just we need to have more grace, I think, for companies that choose to push games back to better polish them. Because every time a triple A game comes out and it's like not finished and barely works and features aren't there, it just further corrodes any yeah. degree of trust in like buying these games. So I feel bad for them. I mean, like, I don't have a strong relationship with Ubisoft. I played a couple Assassin's Creed games before and, and I like Rayman. But it's, <laughs> what? What's so funny? I mean, it's just as, as it's a dated like Ubisoft <laughs> title. I mean, it's not dated. I mean, he gets games. Like, I mean, true, Rayman. but that's like their Mario, right? I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I it sucks to hear this. The uh, at, you know, I was not pleased with Star Wars Outlaws. Star Wars Outlaws was a game that I wanted to like. Then I found out it was Ubisoft making it, and so I was like, okay, what's wrong with it? And so you say that, but I mean, like EA used to make those Star those Star Wars games. People hated them, so I'm yeah. surprised Ubisoft could be seen as even worse. Oh, I never said they were worse than you than just, EA. It's just a different They're type of bad. Just a different type of bad. Okay. I mean, like EA and Ubisoft are some of my least favorite companies in the gaming space, just because of the way they latched on to like microtransactions and live service style gaming. Uh I feel like they lost their own identities in chasing profits. I feel like they've made decisions that are anti-gamer and promoted they and promoted game mechanics that or even market they've promoted marketing practices that I just don't care for. Yeah. The aggressive like look up uh, you know, pre-orders and Yeah, Ubisoft is pretty big on those pre-order DLCs games. on yeah. release. Like, golly. I remember one Ubisoft game that I thought was really cool was the, uh, what was like the, the spy, like, information, Watch Dogs? Oh, Watch Dogs. Surveillance kind of based one. I remember people were pretty excited about Watch Dogs. I know it didn't go over all too well, but. What, what, Watch Dogs was a was mixed cool. bag. The At the time when Watch Dogs 1 came out, I couldn't buy it. But I really did want to buy Watch Dogs 1. Missed out on it. Watch Dogs 2 came around. And I think I just I just never got around to giving it a try. Yeah. But you know, Ubisoft did have that one um, that one animated series on was it Netflix? Uh, I think yeah, Netflix or Hulu or something. I cannot remember the name of it. Yeah, we watched that. I liked that. But, but I, I thought it was fun. It made me optimistic about Ubisoft titles because they are in, they have interesting franchises and they have. Like solid character design and world building, and in their games, just everything else around it. Ah. Well, good luck to them. I would hate to see Ubisoft go. I know there are some people out there who probably would love to see it go, but I don't want Ubisoft always, to be bought out. I just want Ubisoft to change their practices. Well, people who are more informed on the matter, or maybe have stronger opinions on the matter, I would like to hear what you have to say because. I've played a little bit of, you know, some Ubisoft games here and there. I would like them to just get their act together and do better. But well, knows. luckily, it turns out I lied. I did have a gaming story. Great, and it's actually it. very, it's actually similar. Oh, it's related? Great. Ubisoft monetization director says fan celebrations around Assassin's Creed Shadows Studios' re recent troubles are revolting. Claims any industry peer doing the same is a non-human being. Sorry, I don't understand. The, okay. Essentially, the uh, monetization director uh, is calling out the fans who cheer for their troubles, oh. and they are also calling out any peers in the industry who are cheering on their demise. Hmm. Okay. I want to hear a little more. What's he got to say? 
In the opinion of Ubisoft monetization director uh, Stevie Chassard, not only is it outright shameful for players to be celebrating the Assassin's Creed Shadows developers' struggles, but those within the industry exhibiting the same behavior are exposing themselves as non-decent human beings. Well, that title is not... They, they said it was non-human being, but that's they said non-decent human beings. It's, those so, are literally so they, different so phrases. They, mess, they messed around with the title. Had to workshop it a bit for mm-hmm. some clicks, huh? That, that, that's a... Yeah. Mm. Okay, I mean, I get the gist. Is there more of note? So, taking issue with the widespread cheering that poured out in response to Ubisoft's leadership's recent confirmations that Star Wars Outlaws had sold terribly, Assassin's Creed Shadows was being delayed, and that the company had a... Ho- had a whole as a whole would be undergoing an internal operations audit, which I think is a good thing. He said, I rarely post on social media, but today I am sad. Okay, this is a nice chunky little tweet. The gaming industry is rough at the moment. We all know it. But seeing how gamers, this is quote unquote gamers, react on social medias, wishing ill fate to companies and people alike is sad. Even though it's always the vocal minority that expresses themselves on social media, I was hurt. Hurt and ashamed to be a part of this community. What is even more revolting is coming on LinkedIn and seeing the same comments from people within the industry. On top of exposing yourself as, cl- as clearly a non-decent human being, you are affecting thousands of employees that are already impacted by all the hate despite their best to deliver incredible experiences. Your thoughts? I, he's right. I mean, as someone who has cheered on Ubisoft's demise, I mean, he's he's right. It is it's a it is unfair that any perceived issue that we as gamers have with different Ubisoft titles and different decisions that they've made. We you know we light our pitchforks at any any at the slightest like moment of weakness and we're like yeah we want your whole company to suffer because you didn't have so and so in the DLC of Watch Dogs three yeah. and I was mad about it okay I'll admit that we probably all have gone a little far in our hate of Ubisoft because it's still they make games but the games aren't the company and. There's no such thing as a perfect video game, right? There's going to be something you dislike. There's going to be something that makes you upset. But we shouldn't forget that, you know, Ubisoft as a whole and all the people that make it didn't all decide to screw us over with their mm, wonky monetization practices. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things at fault. Maybe we should just specifically target CEOs. Or maybe we should get the names of their shareholders and blame them instead. Well, all I have to say about it is he's right, and I completely agree with him. I know that people, you know, don't take well to. Actually, I've had a bit of a rant about this. Oh, I don't. Here we go. I mean, so I should preface by saying, like, I am not like an active gamer. I would, call, I wouldn't call myself like you know. I'm not. I don't own a game console. I guess I have a Switch. I've played when people. You want a YCS? Over. Yeah, I won my Switch twice. Yes, I don't play it. Um, you know, so I get that my opinion maybe kind of sounds like that of an outsider, but I think that people are way too hard on game developers in general. I, like, I think just the outcry, the backlash. I think that a lot of it doesn't even feel genuine at some point. Mm-hmm. Like, there's people who just hate on games. Like, there's there's already the console wars where it's like you know, X bots and Sony ponies attacking each other and like you know, hoping for the downfall of one console. Ha, Xbox failed this year because they're being outsold and they didn't have good enough games at this showcase. Or like Sony sucks and you know they don't even have any game. That's insane to me. Like it's I think when you when you forget that there are like human beings working on these games and you are cheering on like bad sales or bad reviews mm-hmm. or games getting canceled or games like, you know, getting pushed back, it's I think it is it just feels not it feels like it's just it's bad faith. Like you're calling yourself like you know like I'm a gamer and all this stuff, but like why are you so pleased to see bad news? I mm-hmm. get it. I know that these companies like it's capitalism, right? These companies are going to do some things. They're going to charge for some DLC or some microtransaction. 
I don't support that. I'm not saying you have to buy that. I'm not saying that that's good. What I am saying, though, is that like if they're working on games and try, like, trying to release something, like the alternative is that there's nothing. Right. Right? Like, I mean, and these people are trying their best. Like, it's weird. I don't know if it's because I'm not as into gaming as I maybe was as a teen. Because I've been in that, you know, like, I read all the gaming news. I have these strong opinions on every company. Maybe now that I'm, like, not as much of a, like, avid gamer and I just kind of see the headlines and then see the response. I mean, maybe that's allowed me to, like, I don't, I just don't know. But I don't like it. It doesn't make me feel good. Like, I just think that people are so willing to just attack everything and, and cheer on the demise of everything and being a mob. Yeah. And then when someone like him speaks out, he's just going to get like responses where it's like, like, haha, you deserve it. Oh, you're being soft. Oh, you're complaining now. Oh, you should have thought about that when you were charging people so-and-so for DLC or whatever. It's like, you're missing the point, I feel. Which is that like, they are trying to make this game good and it's taking some more time and that's not bad. You know, I think we need to apply a lot of that to Konami as well. I think a lot of that's true for them as well. Just doing their, you know, just doing their best. These are multi, these are multi stage corporations. Lots of people are making lots of decisions, and the thing is, one person is not responsible for all the issues with your game, your what your franchise. It's the decisions of many different people who are all working kind of on their own. It's not a, uh, it's not a, there's not some evil cabal that's specifically trying to make gaming horrible for everyone. It's everybody, every, a bunch of people all doing their best to try and make a successful game and make money at the same time. Yeah, and I think people kind of have lost some sight of that because, you know, there are great Ubisoft games. I was actually sitting here looking up some of the, like, you know, their biggest hits. Obviously, there's Assassin's Creed. I know people have mixed opinions about Assassin's Creed today, but nobody can deny Assassin's Creed was, like, kind of a groundbreaking thing back in the 360 generation. Yeah. Assassin's Creed I, 1, I was going to say the PS3 3. generation, but yeah, you can say 360. 360, it's PS3, fine. you know, that whole thing. But also, like, the Far Cry games. Tom Clancy games. I'm so mad my first Far Cry was lame. Like, it's it's kind of wild that people will turn so quickly on these companies because, like, I I know that they're upset with a company maybe for not, you know, releasing a certain thing or charging too much. But, like, man, listen, if Ubisoft wasn't here, we wouldn't be any better off for it. But I do have another question. What should players do instead of voicing their dissatisfaction. I'm a firm believer in just like, you know, pay with your wallet, like vote with your wallet. Mm -hmm. If you don't like the Ubisoft game, then don't buy it. I think that all this like shrieking and screaming. Now, now there are actually like forums for feedback. A lot of these games have forums specifically for that, where you can actually submit like reviews and feedback. That's productive. But just the whole like, Gleeful. I'm just happy that to see that sales are down or reviews are down and they deserve it. And like they're evil. Co That's just noise. And developers and like people who are working these games have to see that. And it's, the, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too. I saw two sides of this because I was really tuned into the Star Wars Outlaws release. So on one hand, you had the kind of bought and paid for reviews by certain large websites, they'll go unnamed, that build Star Wars Outlaws to be this immaculate, perfect representation of the Star Wars franchise, well worth your $70, and, and, and the, uh, the built-in DLC that it launched with, if you want to enjoy the full experience, then that was more than worth the cost, and you know, they, you know those reviews went out. Yep. But then... I saw other YouTube videos of people ranting about all the issues they had with the game. Now, game devs would, would tell you that those guys are being unfair and that they are causing this mob mentality amongst gamers. But I do think there needs to be a bit of a balance to this. If you can curate reviews that make your game sound like the most perfect thing God ever gave us, then there should also be reviews that are tearing it apart. Now, social media has a way of giving people access to devs. They feel closer to them than they ever have before. And I think that's where it tends to go a step further. Yeah. But um, it's, it stratifies so many things. Like, I mean, I think back to the magic situation from last week. 
where you know the death threats and the doxing. Like, I would hope we're not throwing out death threats. Oh over. no, game companies have gotten those plenty of times. They're but been, not like, over stories. Assassin's Creed. Uh, the popular theory is no one even plays those games. Yeah, that's what at least that's what keeps you. people yeah. keep saying. Despite the fact they keep making more of them, I don't think they keep making Assassin's Creeds if no one was playing them. Somebody's yeah. lying. I don't know. All I'm going to say about it is you have to like cool off and like take a step back, I think. Like don't if you don't like a game, you know, don't buy it. If you buy it and you're disappointed with it, hey, try to get a return if you, you know, haven't played it for very long and leave like a constructive review. I think too many people will get lost in just this whole like the review needs to be scathing and like, you know, you have to kind of like hit at all these kind of these more cultural points that are like that go beyond the game itself. Like you just shouldn't have been I mean this. Like, but like at the end of the day, we are I think that we're like lucky that we have video games and can play play them. Am I am I being too So I don't know. I do like, think we there is a lack of respect on the side of game developers when it comes to consumers. I don't think they respect the fact that you're asking people to spend money on these games. If all these games came out for free and we were still yelling about how awful we hate and we hate them so much, I, then it's like it's like okay guys, relax. No, you're like, just being you, ungrateful. This you, this was a privilege, and I don't know why y'all are just like biting the hand. But you got to remember, it's because they you're want being us to spend seventy like, bucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like people don't have a lot of disposable income. Uh, getting a refund on a game is not always the easiest thing. It's, it's easier than it's ever been before, but it's not the easiest thing in the world. And like, given the situation monetarily that I find myself in, that many people find themselves in, like year round. It can feel like it can feel to like an a extra game, pain. Yeah, and then not be. I get it. I mean, I don't know. I, but I think that's never an excuse to like laugh at the demise or downfall of like people's jobs. I mean, that might be late stage capitalism off. cynicism. You yeah, know? like yeah, maybe it is that kind of late stage capitalism thing. We're cynical. We don't care anymore. In a weird, because if you think about it, like if. I'm at the bottom, right? If I am broke as a joke and, you know, I'm saving my next $70 for the next game that I like, seeing, like, Ubisoft fall apart doesn't actually seem... I don't actually feel much sympathy for that because I'm not... I was never doing well. Yeah. All I'm seeing is them coming down to my level. Yeah, I don't... Know. So, not should you be laughing at it? I don't think so. But I understand why someone might be. I guess. I... I think we got it. I don't want to see Ubisoft yeah. go. Just to be clear. I think we got to just get I a grip. I don't want to see. Actually, I really don't want to see any game company close. Mostly because I have I have happy memories. Of, of all the game companies I, I criticize, I have happy memories of all of them. Even EA, surprisingly. Like, I don't want these games, these companies to close. I just want them to change their practices. Well, anywho. Next. Um, as like, I think as long as people can express that respectfully... And like properly, then I'm okay mm-hmm. with it. I just bring I back that, sled storm, EA. You know what I'm, I'm talking about. Screaming and yelling and insults is not good. Okay, well, um, next story, I suppose. I'm kind of scared to mention this one now. You got something fun for us? Oh, it's not fun. Okay. Joker Two becomes infamous box office bomb as insiders brand it a huge disaster. Yeah, I've seen this. And by seeing, I mean I haven't seen the movie. But I've seen the terrible press, the bad, you know, first weekend at the box office. I haven't seen this movie either. And I think it's weird. And I'm starting to realize that social media may play a larger role in helping these movies fail than I ever thought before. Man, we really did just get off of a topic where I feel like (laughs) I've, like, worn myself out with complaining. (laughs) I, so... For the longest time, I've actually wanted to, like, make just, like, a a personal YouTube channel of mine where I just talk about my thoughts on some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of the number one things I've wanted to talk about is this hyper fixation. It's a continuation of the Ubisoft thing, I suppose. On, like, review scores and sales numbers, like, open, like, just the way they become, like, these headlines 
and points of comparison and like this thing where we form so many opinions about like what a movie is or isn't or should or shouldn't be and don't just fucking see the goddamn thing. Yeah. Like, listen, if you weren't interested in watching Joker 2, then don't watch it, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that like, you know, for these people who have so much to say about how awful, you know, it's such a fall off, it's so bad, just see it and like form your own opinion on that. Now, here's the thing. If you see it, and you don't like it, and you're like, okay, I went to see this movie and I was disappointed, then, like, you know, have at it. You you bought a ticket, you went, you were disappointed, you did not get what you wanted out of this, and you have reason to be... But it's a, there's something odd to me about, like, just the headlines where it's like, yeah, just had such a poor box office showing, and the, the Rotten Tomatoes score is, like, 20% or whatever, and it just, you know... It's... Again, it feels like an almost gleeful cheering on of... And and this I'm saying this without like I do I have not seen the movie myself. That's mm-hmm. the thing. So more what I'm saying is just that it's interesting that like it's there's so many outside signals before I can just go and see it. Right. Anyway, sorry I've talked long enough. Yeah. So I brought this up because I actually I don't want to really read the article because I don't want the Joker two movie spoiled for me. At some point I do want to watch it, but so, I wanted yeah. to bring this. I saw the first one by the way. <laughs> So I just put that out there. We are informed today, y'all. But I want to bring this up because I knew Joker 2 was going to be a bomb before it came out. And this is not me being some type of a prophet or a seer or that guy is only I knew the truth. It's because people were already reporting that it was going to be a bomb before it came out. And I'm starting to realize that Social media has a way of creating these self-fulfilling prophecies. prophecies. I know, yeah. Because Joker 2, I haven't seen it yet. It could be as good or worse than the original Joker 2. Or it could be or it could be better, right? Those are the three options. Now, early reviews come out, they're lukewarm. And then someone says, nah, it's just straight up bad. And then before the movie comes out, now everyone's talking about how Joker 2 won't make a billion dollars. I had two different people tell me that Joker 2 won't make a billion dollars. I've never had, I've never heard a phrase like that before where someone's telling me before a movie comes out, yeah, I just don't think this is going to make a billion dollars. Like, what do you, what does that you know, mean? It's kind of weird when you hear that from normal people because yeah. it's like, it's, it's like, what, what is that? matter to you like a billion i don't as a poor person i don't have a concept of a billion dollars what do i care if joker 2 makes or doesn't make a billion so what i think it's i think it's a mixture of two things i think that there is kind of this envy thing going on where it's like okay they spent a lot of like you know if you're just a poor layman just a regular person you kind of go and see videos see movies, movies and stuff you know there's kind of maybe a joy in the idea that the big wigs in Hollywood who spend all this money, like, didn't get their investment back. Like, you know, my life sucks and I can't afford to pay rent, but, like, they didn't make the money back on their movie. So, huh. Like, there's kind of that, mm-hmm. where these people like to see that failure. But I also think that there's this weird, and maybe this isn't the same people saying this. It's going to be a slightly different thing of, like, everybody kind of wants to be a makeshift film critic sort of everybody does want where to have an it's, opinion you know and maybe in late stage capitalism it's almost like if i can there's some invisible award for being able to sort of predict mm. how well movies will do or games or movies will sell or something that's just the sense that i get sometimes when i read this stuff online is that people are kind of like you know, getting very haughty on their armchairs, just saying like, yeah, it's like, this won't sell very well. And this one, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, people are like, yeah, this won't sell well. And like, here's why. And if you disagree, you must not know anything about how movies work. And it's like, and th- then they, you know, they preen when they, and what their feather and, in their cap. When yeah. And the movie it doesn't, doesn't do, do well, well, it's like, yeah, see, like it was always doomed to fail. And it's like, well, I don't know, genius. Maybe if you just, Shut up. Like, if you think it's going to be so bad, then keep keep it moving, right? Move it feels on. like the deck that maybe the Joker 2 is a weaker movie compared to the first. But it feels like social media stacked the deck against, against it to movies. make sure yeah, and it's it could not, not make There have been a lot of movies like this. There have been a lot where it's just 
people seem so pleased with the idea that some things will just do well and like some things won't and there's like a tribalism to it where you're there almost is. angry that like a movie did well because you thought it wasn't like how did it do well like i don't so i don't as critis as critical as i am of like video games in the gaming industry i'm actually less critical of hollywood and movies just because you know the premium we're getting when it comes to watching movies in theaters. And people always complain about, oh, the movie theater is too expensive. I could just watch this at home, yada, yada, yada. But for real, though, you know, the price of movie tickets have not kept up with inflation at all. They've, all, they've always been, quote unquote, more expensive than what we think they should be. But movie tickets are, are at the price of movie tickets, movies are shown to us at a loss for most theaters. I think that, you know, I don't know. I think that there is something to be said about the the intangibles of going to see a movie. Like, mm -hmm. you know, this will obviously vary from area to area. Some places are charging like, you know, $18 for a ticket. That sounds really high. But also, I know some places you can get like, get like a matinee for like six bucks, which to yeah. me, reasonable. Well, I, anyway, I got three on me right now. So I think that like the experience of meeting up with some friends, mm -hmm. you know, meeting up with a couple friends and like going to the movie theater at night, like there's kind of a, it's something you don't get every day. You're getting a get out of the house. It's an see event. Your friends. It's an event. And in many cases, you know, if you're like an adult, you know, in your twenties, thirties, everybody kind of has work. So the fact that you were all able to get off yep. on like, you know, this Friday night, whatever, Saturday night, go see this movie with your friends, huge theater, huge screen, you know, immersive audio, and, you know, you get a bag of popcorn and a Coke or whatever. It's, like, I know that it is, it can be expensive, but I do think that there's, like, something to be said of that experience, right? So, I mean, like, there's a reason that we want, that we follow that box office coverage is because, like, you know, who was willing to go out and, like, see? Like, to me, when I see a bad movie on a streaming service... I'm like almost, I don't want to say more upset, but when I go out to see a movie and I'm not like super pleased with it, I'm usually just happy that I got to like see my friends for the first time in like a month or something. Like just to get, we were all just together watching a movie. Well, like, that says a lot about you seeing your friends. You gotta do better than that. I know. But, and I think that that's like a relatable experience for a lot of people. The older you get and the more people are working and the more mm -hmm. like, you know, you don't get to just have meetups like every day so i don't know I, I mean getting a group together to see a movie is like pulling teeth that yeah. is not easy and i know i guess i'm getting off topic here but i don't like just cheering on the downfall of so many things i don't i don't know why we want to see movies fail i don't think movies did anything to us i don't think they did either i, I mean i i get where you can be a little bit more snippy about games i will admit Microtransactions. I mean, every game you play is a giant chunk out your wallet. Every movie yeah. you watch is a smaller chunk out your yeah, wallet. Yeah, like, I, I think that... Whatever. Okay, anything else to say about the story? I, I just don't want to say any spoilers, so I'm not going to read too much. What I will say is this. I didn't think we ever needed a Joker 2. Two. I believed Joaquin Phoenix when they said that, you know, he never does the same role twice and there would never be a joke or two. I did feel, I feel, I do feel, I feel a bit lied to in that regard. Not that I trusted Joaquin Phoenix, but as like artist integrity, I, I, I did, I, tr I decided to trust that. Yeah. So when I, when it was, when this was announced, I was not excited for it. I was like, oh man, I really was hoping that that would be a one-time deal, but it's still a piece of like it's a still a piece of art that a lot of people worked on and I still want to see it because I want to know what made what made Phoenix say yes what what why did Gaga sign on what 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 was the story that they thought was worth a joker to and then I, then I can afterwards I can say whether or not I think it was worth it you know we went to go see uh, Madam Web which I'll tell anybody was a not a great movie I'm I would not tell anyone to like take out time to go see Madam Web, but I'm actually glad I saw it. I wanted I wanted to know what Madam Web is like. Will I watch it again? Never. But I do know now. Yeah, I had another story about like backlash culture around movies and stuff, but I'm actually going to shelve it. I don't feel like <laughs> I, I feel. Just, just give really, me just give me a taste. What was it about? 
Um, I'm just I'm very worn on this topic. It was a, from Amanda Stenberg, who is the lead of the Star Wars series, The Acolyte. Ah, uh, yeah. And she was just talking about Send that to you know me. yeah I will. Uh, she was talking about you know kind of these the angry toxic fandom problem, mm-hmm. how people sort of almost they begin their tirades against these movies and shows and stuff even before the theaters hits, like even as early as casting. I mean, or the first trailer. Oh, you cast this person that I don't like in this role. It's yeah. automatically going to fail. You know, I felt I saw a post about how Disney did not, or at least it was criticism that Disney did not protect the actors on that project and kind of just let them take the brunt of the criticism and then just pulled the product, the project. Yeah. So not going to get into that story. I feel like I've said enough today about how I feel about just people <laughs> that do that. So. Um, I do have a interesting kind of tech story. What you got? Apple is reportedly moving away from annual launches. Good. Yeah, it sounds like this might be a little bit more uplifting. So if there's one thing we can usually set our Apple watches to. It's Apple's schedule of releases. There's a spring event with the Max, WWDC in June with all the OS previews, September's for iPhones and Apple watches. October is all about the Macs and the iPads. And Apple only occasionally deviates from that routine. But according to Mark Gurman, writing in his latest Power On newsletter, Apple isn't interested in continuing that cycle. In a detailed report that examines Apple's strategy and the problems it's caused, including the delay of Apple intelligence, that's their new like kind of AI thing that's going to be in their phones. Great. It is not actually available on release of the iPhone 16. It's going to be coming like a couple months later. Mm -hmm. And other key products, Gurman points to the Apple Watch Ultra 2's new color as a sign that Apple is shifting away from updating products to fit a timeline and instead saving features to make a bigger splash. So, tech YouTubers in shambles. Yeah, a longer long story short, it sounds like Apple may not be doing like every single product gets an update every single year, which currently that's not exactly how they do it. Like some products are Yeah, every it's a, it's a little fuzzy, years. but yeah. But things like the iPhone and the Apple Watch, for instance, like definitely always get yearly updates and it sounds like they might be moving away from that. Um and my Kind of just first reaction is, I think, good. I think all tech needs to move away from yearly updates. I don't think there's a piece of tech in our lives that needs a yearly update. Yeah, you know, that's why I'm so pleased to see Apple doing it, because so much of the tech industry follows Apple. Yep. You know, whenever there's like a change in the iPhone, all the other phone manufacturers copy mm-hmm. it. And, you know, for good reason, right? Like, Apple makes, like, good enough products, but when they can change something and other other people can, like, follow along, that would be good to me, because... You're 100% right. I don't think that there's like a really a product that you should need to update each year and be like forced to feel that you need to. You need to upgrade your phone. You need to upgrade your watch. You need to upgrade like everything every year. And can you, wait, when you really think about it, upgrading a watch yearly is insane. But there's like the Apple super fan who they got to be on that cutting edge. They got to they gotta have that and give Apple their money for another like, you know, four or $500 smartwatch or whatever this year. I think... That like, and I've been there. I'm a tech enthusiast. Mm-hmm. I know the feeling of like the FOMO, right? Your you, phone you, just starts feeling slower, heavier, and old. dumber. Yeah, it just feels <laughs> old. Or I mean, same with like cameras, right? Like I remember I bought like the face cams that we use for this um, A6600, and then they released the Sony A6700. Like not that long after I bought these, and I was like, oh no, it's got a couple of features that these don't have. And then, like, there's like this that tech FOMO, but then like, should I buy? new ones that's a lot of money so i would be okay with this change i don't think that we need a new iphone and i don't think we need a new samsung phone or nope. anything like every year i just i think that we could afford to slow down i mean given the fact that people seem to have less money than ever yeah i think it's a great idea we slow down just so that we because it feels predatory when you know lots of people are underemployed or unemployed and but their devices keep updating that they get the feel of the, that, that FOMO, FOMO feeling, you know, when you don't have a lot of things, you, it, yeah. you feel this desire whenever new things come out, a, arguably a stronger desire because you can't afford a lot of things. You just you really want to upgrade the things that, that you have that you're falling behind somehow. And like, and maybe you maybe you skip one update, but the next one's on the dot next year. Here it is. And it's and like I think that also the generational leaps have gotten so small. I mean, it feels like just diminishing returns when you. I mean, a a, a flagship phone from like three years ago is fine. 
Yeah. It's fine. It will play My all- flagship phone from two years ago is fine. It will play all of your your Genshin Impact or whatever. It will play your games. It will, it can run fine. It takes perfectly fine pictures. We are getting just these, like, you know, microscopic, you know, improvements in sensor quality on the cameras or, like, you know, a lot of stuff's been set in stone for years. Like, the resolution on the screens and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of this hasn't actually changed very much. And so, really and truly... I think that taking, say, like two years instead of one year per phone cycle could mean at least there's time to actually work on like a meaningful new feature. And so you can actually call it an upgrade. Yeah, you can actually call it an upgrade. Like, okay, there's actually a significantly larger battery in this. Or it's actually I using sw- a new like camera sensor. I promise you, you, you take the last five years of iPhones and the last five years of like Samsung's, the last five years of like any device, mix them up, put them in front of me. I'm going to struggle to actually figure really out distinguish. which one is which. Yeah. Because the the changes are so minute, minute and small. Designs don't change much. The specs don't change much. Like, the only thing I can probably point to is the number of cameras on them. Like, it feels like we're just adding, like, one more There's camera every camera year. That you won't actually use. Like, you won't. Because, I mean, you're not gonna use your why does my, telephoto yeah, why does my phone have wide. two front-facing cameras? Yeah. Well, this one's for the video. This one's it's got like three on the back. It's an ultra-wide one. Yeah, no, I don't. I, so, I hope that Apple seriously does do this. Like, slow down. Mm-hmm. And then I hope that Samsung and Google and everybody else can yeah, Take along. note. Follow along. It's the one time where I'm like, just do what Apple does. Anyways, that was my, uh, my little tech bit. Got anything else for us? I'm tapping out for this pod. Okay. Well, I've got one last one to end us on a not amazing or happy note. Oh, okay. Dragging us it's back down into the while, depths. And we are going right back down to hell with an AI story. Oh, my favorite. Yeah. You thought you wouldn't get one? Well, here it is. So, I quit teaching because of chat GPT. Uh, this, did the teacher think this is that... This a teacher who... The, the chat GPT do their job better than them or not exactly. So um, this fall is the first in nearly 20 years that I am not returning to the classrooms from Victoria Ooh. Livingston. Long time teacher. Like. For most of my career, I taught writing literature and language primarily to university students. I quit in large part because of large language models like chat GPT. So, um, I'm trying to find, because I've actually read through this before, and I'm trying to, like, find the best parts of this. In my most recent job, I taught academic writing to doctoral students at a technical college. My graduate students, many of whom were computer scientists, understood the mechanisms of generative AI better than I do. They recognized LLMs as unreliable research tools that hallucinate and invent citations. They acknowledged the environmental impact and ethical problems of the technology. They knew that models are trained on existing data and therefore cannot produce novel research. However, that knowledge did not stop my students from relying heavily on generative AI. Several students admitted to drafting their research in note form and asking ChatGPT to write their articles. So she got really tired enough with this. She said, in one activity, my students drafted a paragraph in class, fed their work to ChatGPT with a revision prompt, and then compared the output with their original writing. However, these types of comparative analyses failed because most of my students were not developed enough as writers to analyze the subtleties of meaning or evaluate style. Quote, it makes my writing look fancy, one PhD student protested when I pointed to weaknesses in AI revised text. Um, They also relied heavily on AI-powered paraphrasing tools such as Quillbot. I've never heard of that. Never heard of it. Yeah, and so basically, as a result, I found myself spending many hours grading writing that I knew was generated by AI. I noted where arguments were unsound. I pointed to weaknesses such as stylistic quirks that I knew to be common to chat GPT. I noticed a sudden surge of phrases such as delves into. That is, I found myself spending more time giving feedback to AI than to my students. So Oof. I quit. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a college professor teaching, you know, graduate and like PhD level students, doctorate mm-hmm. level students. And they were using AI and she's like, well, fuck it. Like if, if you guys just are going to insist on using AI to write, like write everything, there's no point in me even giving feedback on an essay, giving feedback on, like, research papers if, you know, it's just written by AI if you just don't care. Thoughts? Man. She's, so she's actually, she quit. She's been doing this for 20 years. She's out of here. This wasn't, this was not 
I did not expect this repercussion from generative AI. I hadn't thought about the impact it would have on teachers that teach writing because the fact of the matter is AI isn't good enough for high level academic writing. Oh, for sure. Someone who knows, like someone who knows what they're doing when it comes to technical writing and creative writing at, at that level, they can sniff out AI. The problem is for a lot for those students that AI writing will get them through 99% of life otherwise. And so it then falls to this like one teacher and or, or the many teachers in the world who specialize in writing and language arts. They have to now contend with technology. It, but they're supposed to be teaching, but instead they're jousting with these, with these, algorith- these algorithm-driven systems that are learning and trying to be better than her at her profession. I mean, so I actually kind of am almost, I mean, I think you're right, to be clear. I actually read it even differently than that, where traditionally you look at AI as like, oh, it's going to like replace a bunch of jobs. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's not so much that it's like replacing her job. It's almost just more like she's just not getting to like do her job. Right. Like it doesn't seem like it was threatening to get her fired in any way. It's just more like, I'm, my students are not actually writing. They're just using ChatGPT, and I'm sitting here grading it. I'm just grading AI work. What's the point? They don't care about my revisions because as far as they're concerned, they couldn't write it themselves anyway. Yeah. So I really hate that for her, and I, I do hate that for professors. And just it does worry me, you know, will we – maybe this is like, you know, too much doom. I'm dooming here or whatever. But, like, will there just be a point where, like, why should I even bother learning how to write? I'll just have like ChatGPT write for me. It doesn't make perfect sense or whatever, but who cares? I couldn't do it myself. I mean, I think we were already at that point before the large language models kind of took over. You yeah. know, I wasn't, it was, I know I'm old, but it wasn't that long ago that I was in college. I've seen my Many peers write ago. and I've seen my own writing. My own writing isn't up to snuff. But I've seen my peers write even worse than I do. And many of them have now graduated and moved on in the world with writing that a fifth grader would be disgusted with. But now that we have chat GPT and all these large language models, now you have the crutch you've been waiting for. You'd already stopped trying to learn how to write in the first place, but now you really don't have to because chat GPT will do it for you. And it's, it's actually a little hard to argue with when... Students are coming out of like high school and middle school already having used chat GPT this entire time to yeah. do all their writing for them. They get to college. Like, do you as a professor, do you really want to fight and try to like hold every student accountable who's using AI? Because that's that's going to be a long fight with a lot yeah. of people. And so it's like so she was trying. It sounds like she did try to find creative ways to incorporate it into the classroom first. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, maybe letting the students use it so then she can, like, identify, okay, here's where, you know, a failing of AI. But they don't care because they'll just use it anyway. Yeah, they they will. I mean, there are people who, there. I know it's hard to believe, but there are people who are so good at writing, you know, they proofread other people's papers. And, oh, Paul, you were one of those. You, you You were one of those good writers. Yeah. How would you have felt if you were being approached to proofread just these generated papers. Yeah, it's insulting. Yeah, for a bit of context, um, I when I was in school at least, I, mean, I don't know about today, but I, I was told I was a pretty good writer. Um, I enjoyed writing essays, or at least I didn't find it to be, you know... I know a lot of people hate writing. The, clearly, you know, this chat GPT thing is showing a lot of people do... St- I always felt that it's close to what you said. I don't think that people just suck at writing by choice. I mean, you can trace it back to a lot of different things, like, your education or whatever, but I think that people develop a sense of um, helplessness around mm-hmm. their writing and kind of the despair sets in. So whenever there'd be like a big assignment, you know, you're going to have to write this research paper, write this essay, people are just like, oh no, look, I can't do that. And so they already kind of believe that they, my writing's no good. I'm terrible at it. There's no hope. Yeah. And so that's kind of where you get plagiarism so often. And I guess nowadays it's where, you know, I was just plugging in chat GPT. It might not be perfect. It might make mistakes, but it's better than anything I could do. That's what a lot of people believe. 
if somebody came to me and they, you know, I've already had people come to me and just give me, like, you know, I would proofread people's papers sometimes. And people will just show up with, like, plagiarized shit. And, I, and it's, it's frustrating. It actually, like, pisses you off. Because it's like, okay, don't come to me with this. Like, if you want to yeah, plagiarize, great. You, tu- you can turn it into the professor and whatever happens, happens after that. But I'm just saying, like, you know, it's almost insulting to use it and then, like, give it to someone for proofing. Uh, you know. I don't know. I, I worry because right now we already have kind of this you know, misinformation epidemic going on and in many regards. Thanks, AI. But, like, it just doesn't help that now, like, you won't even be able to, like, trust that most of what you're reading is real, like, mm-hmm. at all. I, I have this fear even that it's not exactly related to, like, paper writing, but just that say you become a doctor, which I know that that's, there's more to just becoming a doctor than just, like, writing a few essays. Trust me, I know. I can write but, three essays. You know, if you had to maybe, like, write up a, a diagnostic about a patient and you were, like, just using AI to do it, any mistake in that could be, could be life fatal. or death. That could be fatal. You know? But at least it'll be legible. Yeah, and it'll sound good. That's the thing that AI is best at is it's good at lying confidently. Yes. It can sound like it knows exactly what it's saying. But, yeah, I mean, like any small word choice thing, it could be like a subtle nuance that's lost could, like, cost someone their life. And I think that that's something that needs to really be considered. But, you know, Ginny's out of the bottle now, so... The best you can really do, I think, if you are a teacher, is try to do what she did and at least, like, you know, try to inform students of some of the shortcomings of it, where it could maybe be useful in brainstorming, but where, like, you still need to kind of, you know, go that last mile yourself. I don't know. Or maybe you start just ambushing the students. Just, uh, all right, everybody, so I want you to write the last uh, closing paragraph of your essay right in front of me right now. So uh, no, teachers do that. Yeah, too. oh, no, no, you can't look at it. You just got to write it from memory. As long as it's close, you're good. Just, just write what you, what, what you wrote before. Yeah, I mean. Boy, I would fail. Because don't get me wrong, like, I think that um, for better or worse, AI is like a part of the future. The future is going to have AI in it. it I think that to, to believe otherwise is, yeah. you know. Everyone said the genie's out the bottle. It's yeah. not going back in. But I do think that, like, we at least got to, like, let people. I just don't want people to, like, lose their ability to even write. I mean. Because AI will just do it for you. My personal anecdote on this. Uh, I really wish chat GPT was a bigger thing when I was in school because I was one of those people who had no confidence in writing whatsoever. I consistently was a uh, an average writer to below average, and not, and that wasn't because of choice. I remember um, my I did uh, what was that program where you took college classes in high school? Uh, I, I forget know what, what you're it was. Like, about, it was like yeah. one of those early start programs. I remember I took my uh, English my my English literature class, and I had to, I wrote and I was I was writing essays for the class, and my entire time in school, my essays were fine, and I was getting like D's and F's on all my papers, and I, I yeah. did, I didn't and get at some it, point it just, and it, it kind of just crushed me. I think from then on, I was like, yeah, I'm just a horrible writer, yeah. and, I, and I, I can never get it done. I know there's going to be like the kind of like teachery tutory side of me, but I really hate it. Is heartbreaking to hear that from students. Because, you know, I've, I've actually worked as a writing tutor for a couple of years. And I hate hearing students be defeated, like, coming in. Like, it just, mm-hmm. I can't write. There's no point in, like, trying to get better because, like, I've tried in the past and I've just failed at it and I don't know what I, like. And so at, the, at some point they just aren't, they are no longer. Yeah. Writing is just, it is not something I am capable of doing as a human being. And I hate that. But I will cut it there. Uh, I know that this, this has already gone on long, and I'm just, this is <laughs> what went from, it started off as like a fine podcast. I feel like I'm distressed now. Well, you know. So. We so can de-stress That's what the pot is for. Yeah, I can do a little pot when you're stressed. That's right. De-stress. So just a reminder, guys, if you ever want to submit questions for the pot of greed, you can do so. The link down in the description. Just click on it and write as much as you want. We will write them on the cards. Or by also, we, I mean Paul. Yeah, yeah, they're very long questions. I try my best to fit them on the cards. It's not always easy. Also, um, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Rode for doing such a great job with all of the equipment that we use. We actually use Rode mics, Rode pod mics on this podcast. That's right. The logo's on them somewhere. Because I've got the... Got these Mine's in things on. Yeah. We use pod mics. Um, we use a Rodecaster. We actually have a partnered sort of 
commission link down in the description. So if you want to start a podcast or use any of their mics for video, they've got great lav mics. They've got great shotgun mics. We've never had troubles with these. Yeah. Um, road mics are great. So yeah, we have an affiliate link. You want to click it, it helps support us, and that would be really good. And then maybe they'll send us some upgraded cool podcast supplies. That's the real reason why I'm plugging it. So buy something, darn it. No, they really are great. I mean, I, I've used Road stuff like Thanks, whole Road. YouTube time. So thanks to them. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me draw these cards. From the pot of greed, you know what that means. We draw. I drew my two cards. I got my. Oh, wait, that's three. That is three. That is not two. There we go. Okay. You all you want to go first? I will. So it says, do you like the current structure of Yu-Gi-Oh? Oh, of Yu-Gi-Oh pre-release events. I would prefer sealed draft play. Okay. Okay, yeah. So I guess this person is saying that sneak peeks. Mm-hmm. I guess normally at sneak peeks now, you just kind of, you go and, and you play in a tradition, just a, a regular advanced constructed format tournament. tournament, right? Yeah. yeah. And they were thinking that maybe they could improve. They can improve the sneaky experience by like having draft be a part of it. So I do think sealed play would be more fun, but I think that'd be more fun in general, not just at uh, sneak peeks. Mm-hmm. But I think with modern day Yu Gi Oh products, you can't. They're do not that. designed for it. Yeah. So here's a funny story for um, people who are really new to Yu Gi Oh. You really might not know this. Sneak peeks used to be that. Mm-hmm. Sneak peeks used to be draft. Like you know, you got. X amount of packs and you made a deck strictly with the set, at least if you chose to enter that like tournament. Right. Um, not the case anymore, obviously, but um, I always thought that, that was really cool. I would love if we could go back to it. Here's the trouble though. Modern Yu-Gi-Oh sets just aren't built for draft. They yeah. they really aren't. The we it's archetypes and like it's so, you know, sometimes like for instance, you know, Rage of the Abyss, right? You can get some of these mm-hmm. shark cards. Or like the Mermel cards or you know, yep. some of that. But in many cases, it's just like expansion on past archetypes. So there's not enough Mermel cards in here to make even a half-functioning deck. They're cool new Mermel cards. But and they have no use in a general deck. A lot of cards are like, if you control a water monster, special summon. On summon, search a water monster. Yeah. And then like... But if you don't have those cards... You have the past Mermel. Then these cards don't do anything. Yeah. Um, as for how else they can maybe improve the sneak peek experience, I mean, I think otherwise they've done a pretty good job of, they have the mat, you know, um, raffles and, and the, so the winner of the tournament usually gets a mat and someone else gets like a raffled one. But I do wish we could somehow tie in the, cause it, this is a sneak peek of a set. I wish we could tie that set into the in tournament directly. somehow. Something cool that I saw they used to do at maybe these were Yu-Gi-Oh day events. I don't know if this is still a thing. But you got a special prize or were eligible for a special prize. They would do these for like Mystic Fighters. I remember it was the one that I went to. But anytime mm-hmm. there's like those deck builder sets, if you use, I think it was at minimum 10 new cards from the new set in your deck, then you were eligible for like a play mat or something. Oh, that's cool. I thought that was kind of neat. So it sort of encourages you to, to play the new stuff. You just bring a 60 card pile, slot in like yeah, the 10 Yu-Gi-Oh. least pain, painful cards and go. And just turn it into some mini engine. I mean, yeah, Modern Yu-Gi-Oh would let you do that, but I don't know. I think that like otherwise I've been enjoying the sneak peeks I've gone to. I've been trying to go to more of them and they, they usually don't disappoint. I mean, for me, who I don't, I'm not great at my a competitive Yu-Gi-Oh anymore and I, you know, I keep up kind of more during pod than I do in real life. Yeah. So, but the payoff at sneak peeks makes sense to me. You know, I'm, I'm, I get new packs and then when I win or lose, I'll get some more new packs. That's get, dope. Yeah. At a regular local though, you know, you're getting your, you know, you'll get your OTS pack and that's cool. But otherwise, you know, I don't want the set from two months ago to keep playing. That that's why I like sneak peeks because it's it new, like it's, it's fresh, old, that, that's it's exciting. An interesting perspective on Yu-Gi-Oh that I think I've also been having and not realizing that I've had is like sets are interesting to me basically for the first like week or two that they're out, and then like mm-hmm. I want to come back when there's a new set. So like, yep, sneak peeks are exciting, but I don't necessarily, yeah, like I don't want to really be like playing for Rage of the Abyss a few weeks from now as much so. I like, I'd be willing to do it, but it's not as exciting. So, okay. Well, my question is: um, we constantly mention a lower power format, but why wait for Konami to do it? Why not use a system like Smogon? 
This person asks. Oh, okay. It's a community-made thing. Yeah, this is a common complaint. A lot of people do cite, you know, okay, like we need kind of heart of the underdog type of format, but like just maybe make it community run. Why bother waiting for Konami? Because Konami doesn't seem to really be too keen on explaining what a low power format would be. I think they have their reasons for not doing that. I think that they probably don't want to, you know, imply that certain decks are stronger or maybe designed to be better than others. And I don't think they really want to promote older, like, products and deck strategies that don't move new products. Yeah, although my argument would be that, I mean, I think that a low-power format can still be totally relevant to new products. I mean... It could be, but you can tell that it's the high power stuff that is the draw of our of our new sets right now, and I don't know if they want to abandon that strategy. So, anywho, um, why don't we just go to as a community do the smoke on thing? Well, it's hard to get community initiatives like kind of off the ground as is. I mean, there's a lot of people like me who don't who don't really respect these, like, non-official, non-legitimate forms of Yu-Gi-Oh! And so we don't promote it. We don't really want to try it. We don't really want to mess with it. And, but then we'll the just problem. complain. And yeah, then we'll just yeah, we'll complain. complain. But we won't so do anything. My very real reason why I don't, like, put a lot of, you know, invest a lot of time into a lot of alternative formats is mostly because it's tough to get people to agree on that and... This is going to be a selfish-ass reason. I am too old now to, like, <laughs> go to the trouble of trying to pretend I know the answer to these formats. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not, you know, I know things I don't like about modern Yu-Gi-Oh, but you see how much flack that the Magic Rules Committee got, like, for yeah. being kind of a group that is trying to do card balance. Like, do you... You know, when you think of, like, what the average Yu-Gi-Oh player wants out of the ban list, everybody has all these different demands, and, like, this should be banned, this should be banned, you should hit Snake Eye this way, you should hit you bell this way. And none of us can really agree on what we do and don't want out of this game. We have, like, these general rumblings, like, I wish the game would slow down, or I wish, you know, the turns weren't so long. But, like, really, when it comes down to it, who would you, who would you trust with that responsibility, Like what, you know. And I think the answer is that we wouldn't trust anybody. We don't even trust Konami to do it. But the thing is, Konami is this kind of like monolithic entity that doesn't really interact with us and just passes rules and laws and we just live and abide by them. In a weird way, for a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh players, that's best. Yeah. There, it doesn't, that way it doesn't feel like, you know, I'm specifically being taken advantage of. I don't think anybody's getting, getting over on me. Konami just did what Konami does. I think people would feel that too. The idea that like someone's trying to kind of get over on them. Because if this took off and was really popular, then who's to say that, you know, the group in charge of it isn't manipulating the market or like letting certain people in on what the next ban list will be. And, you know, I think there's a lot of distrust is probably why this stuff doesn't. Because, I mean, Konami employees aren't even allowed to take part in our, like, in official events yeah, and stuff. Yeah, they can't play in anything higher so than locals. It doesn't feel like when Konami makes the ban list that there's an ulterior motive, maybe outside of profits, but like, they're not trying to, like, get over on you and win the next YCS. They yeah. can't even enter. Well, anywho, um, back to you. A Reddit post talked about putting Master Duel, code, Master Duel codes in physical packs to bridge the gap. What do you think? Okay, this is like the um, MTG Arena codes and stuff, right? Yeah, like Pokemon codes. Yeah. I saw this exact Reddit post. Um, I know the person who made it. I don't know them like personally. You know but them personally. Follow them on Twitter. Best friend. Uh, yeah, we're besties. And so... I agree with the concept of that, actually. I... Mm-hmm. I was kind of shocked that Yu-Gi-Oh! didn't at least... And I'm sure they discussed the possibility of it, but I was shocked that they didn't try to kind of push Master Duel a little harder through the packs. Because like, on the back of Structure Decks, they do advertise Duel Links and Master Duel. Like, in the yeah. little, like, insert. But, yeah, like in Pokemon... The insert you know, could have a, car, a code on it, right? Yeah, exactly. In Pokemon, <laughs> you get a code. And you can put it on, like, Pokemon TCG Online or whatever, and you get a pack. Same pack. It wouldn't work one to one with Master Duel because, like, Master Duel has a totally different pack structure and card pool. But you get honestly, a legacy pack. 
Oh, God, really insult people. But, like, honestly, they could just kind of, you buy a physical pack and get 100 gems in Master Duel. Like, it could just be right. gems. It could just be the currency. I think that would be good because we know that that is something that the shareholders want. They want that. They're trying to, like, kind of bridge, you know, I play Master Duel, but I'm daunted by the TCG or, like, vice versa even. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there's something there. But then I wonder how you try, as, as a business, tracking revenue becomes a little murky there because if they implement a system like that, then there's a lot, there'll be TCG sales that, you know, and they will be buying physical, like, trading cards, but then... They're really doing it to get code suspended in Master Duel. I don't see that as a problem. It it's it's not that it's a problem. I think it's a uh, it's a bit of an uh, accounting issue when you want to account for like what's the exact amount of like revenue that like Master Duel is getting from these like TCG packs being sold. I'll keep it a buck. I don't think they give a shit. I think that it's mo it's money in their pocket. I mean, like given no, no, not to but the separate like saying. business segment that's yeah, no, getting the money. That's true, but I think when you zoom it out, would Konami say no? To, like because I don't see any who would there be any loss incurred? I don't in no, way. I don't think there be any like, losses associated with it because I think it can only really help like for people who if you're already going to buy the TCG packs, mm -hmm. then you'll just buy the TCG packs. And if you want to buy them for Master Duel, then you'll start buying the TCG packs. And there's a chance that, you know, with your physical cards, you'll decide to play physical Yu-Gi-Oh! Or you won't, and they still got a sale out of you. And nothing, like, I, don't, I don't think that anybody, like, hurts for it. No, I'm sure that there might be something obvious that, like, I'm not seeing. But I don't think, like, I mean, even for their accounting, they'd be able to... Because, like, if it's codes... They can know that codes for gems always came from physical packs. Mm -hmm. They can at least track it that far. But if that ends up hurting the master duel bottom line, because if if more people are deciding to get their gems through buying physical card packs than through buying then through like master the duel, thing. then master duel would see could I wouldn't wouldn't say would could see a decrease in revenue, and then the TCG could see an increase in revenue, and that and if you were on the master duel team specifically. You may not want to see saying. that, hmm. even if technically it, it's like Konami is probably just up yeah. across the board. I yeah, I don't know your how specific they, segment. Yeah, it's, I'm not sure if they segment logistically that. it can be. It it's something that has to be worked out, but it is weird they didn't work that out. I think that they should do it because I, uh, I really think that it would be. I mean, you know, because we're not probably ever going to be able to go back to the days of like the codes and the cards. Mm -hmm. You know, that's because obviously. The internet, you just look up the code and just enter it in. So that's not going to really work. But, like, to me, this would just be a win-win. People buy more packs. I think, but I think we have to go back to how Macedon launched. I Randomly. Think, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the reason why we don't have codes in our packs. I think Macedon was launched kind of, like, just completely separately from the TCG. And there wasn't a lot of collaboration at first, and they've only started to just do some advertising a on TCG products. I, I don't know. I don't think there's enough collaboration between those two segments of the business. Well, hopefully they will consider doing it. I doubt they will, though, because, I mean, like, we're this far in, and they don't seem to really be too keen on changing. But here's the last question. What things are on you guys' geek bucket list? So, oh, okay. as like just a general fan of games and anime and all that mm -hmm. movies, whatever books, what are some things that are like on your geek bucket list? Things you want, like places you want to go, maybe, or things you want to just collect or do or uh, Tatooine. What is that? I, I, I'd, I'd like to go to Tatooine. What is that? I don't. Where that is, is the uh, desert planet of Tatooine from Star Wars franchise? Oh, well, realistically. Oh, okay. I'm, I would pick anything. I guess not. Um, I got to finally go to Japan last year, so that mm -hmm. was kind of one of my bucket list things. I would like to go again to because the last time I went, I was kind of the Konami World trip, so we didn't really have as much like time and freedom, I guess, to fully explore. Um, but I would like to go and kind of experience more of that. I want to really experience more of like kind of just the restaurant culture and like kind of book culture in Japan, things like that. Um, I'd like that's to, a big one. I'd like to go to San Diego Comic Con. 
Yes, I would like to go to a Comic Con at all. I have not been to San Diego Comic Con. Um, you know, kind of on the fence about maybe trying to go to New York Comic Con, but I definitely want to go to one. I've gone to plenty of anime conventions, have not gone to a comic convention. Yeah, San Diego Comic Con is really hard to get tickets for, and uh, up in. For so much of my life, it was pretty much an impossible thing to go to. Now it's at least possible. I just got to make it happen at some point. Yeah. Um, anything that you want to like collect or own, cop- like kind of own a copy of or a collection of? I feel like every like Star Wars geek wants to have a wants a lightsaber, and there's so many companies that make them. Like, more more people are getting them. I don't have one yet. At some point, I'd like a good lightsaber. It would get used once, and then it would end up on a shelf somewhere to sit there forever. I've been working on an old-school Yu-Gi-Oh card collection. Mm. Um, I kind of I've stopped for the last few months, but I want to get back to it. I'd like to maybe have, like, one of every, at least foil card from each set, each of the first, like, 12 sets or something. I think that'd be fun, and I'd like to maybe frame them or just have them displayed in some way. I have an almost-finished collection of all the foils from Legacy of Darkness. Yeah. I'm missing, like, two. So, I don't know, and I've even thought about maybe getting into some degree of retro gaming collecting, but I don't really care that much about the games. I'm actually more into, like, the hardware. Like, I'd like to have, like, old Game Boy Colors and, like, Game Boy Advances, things like that. Might be fun. Yeah. Anything like that for you? As far as, like, consoles go, I don't... Retro, retro consoles don't mean, don't mean much to me, personally. There, I wish I had some of my old consoles from when I was a kid as like a sentimental thing, but I don't think I'd want to have a collection just in general. Yeah, I've been kind of mixed on how much even like Yu-Gi-Oh stuff I want to collect because like I've kind of downsized some of my collection recently of like cards and now I'm just torn on like how many figures and models do I want to really have because they're they take up a lot of space and it's a whole thing. So, mm-hmm. anywho, good question, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Something I'm sure else will come to mind as soon as we're done. I'm like, oh, I should have said that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a longer list, but since I'm just sitting here right now in the moment, I can't think of it all. Well, anywho, cool. That's our questions, which means that's it for this episode of The Pod of Greed. Unless, of course, you are a YouTube channel member. Shout out to the, I think now, like 47 of you. Let's go. As of the time of this recording, 47 channel members. Um, the Squad of Greed, some would even call them. Oh, I kind of like they the Squad of Greed. I'm a fan of the Squad. Week. We will have a bonus episode coming for you right after this. What so will we talk tuned. about? Who's to say? We don't know. We figure it out every week. We, we literally kind of just we let it rock. So, um, cool. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. One's in chat, of course, if you were here for the premiere. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Past, Past turn. turn.